Okay. Welcome, everyone. Another episode, Planet Xbox Podcast, episode nine. Special, special uh, episode. And uh, I'm so thankful uh, to the individuals in here to make this happen fairly quick, actually. I thought I had to plan months for this, but uh, didn't quite have to. <laughs> but uh, I am your host, Best Spot Kid Smooth. Got my co host, Gaming Addict, Lord Addict, Iron Lords Podcast. What's going on, guys? We we have a a pretty good show. Got some good topics to talk about. Some good questions. Uh, look forward to it. Especially Colin's input on some of the stuff. And uh, no introduction needed. We got uh, our special guest uh, for the show today is yours truly, Colin Moriarty. Uh, some love him, some hate him, <laughs> but here he is in the flesh, man. Welcome to Planet Xbox. <laughs> Thanks. I appreciate it. your views on my videos help me whether you love or hate me so i appreciate everyone's <laughs> everyone's support um no it's good to be here uh actually it's my own fault my fiance and i were supposed to go away this weekend and uh i botched uh we like going to the specific place for dinner so i just waited too long to get a reservation at that place and then we couldn't go that night so there was no reason for us to go away so this weekend's wide open now and i'm glad to be here with you guys thank you great man great so it's a it's been an eventful weekend and like uh, the the timing of everything has just been so clutch. So, um, I when Attic was a uh, we were talking, it was like, hey, if you if you can get Colin, let's great, let's try to line it up with this whole crazy thing. Maybe the FTC case, whatever, will be over, and it it happens at the same time. So we we're planning for the twenty second, which would be like assuming the closing stuff happens, and then this weekend came available, and I was like, and wow, great, let's uh, let's definitely get into it. So. Uh, all right, guys, before we get into uh, the meat and potatoes, uh, Attic Man, um, what have you been uh, playing uh, this week? I've been playing Persona 5 Royale. I've been really... Every time I play this, Colin, I've played this game like three times. I played it on the PlayStation 4, then lost the save file because I assumed if I had like the plus, I would just get the natural cloud save, but I didn't. So I started playing it on the PS5, and I got to the point where Royale, uh, Royale was on sale. And I was like, okay, let me just get Royale. So I dropped that save file again and started playing Royale. And then it was like, I would say two or three months later is when the, the Xbox version was announced. So I was like, at this point, I might as well just wait for the Xbox version. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've not played uh, Persona 5 at all. Um, Persona 4, I played on Vita. I'd like to get back to it um but just to I, it's hard for me to go back to things um i try to make time but i'm always trying to play newer or more current things yeah. to satiate that i always uh, say the, the audience the gaming timeline is very fast and quick like, it is <laughs> it is like we at sacred symbols we don't deal with publishers or developers we don't get early access we don't get codes we buy all of our own games we don't do endemic advertising any of that so we play all of our games at the same time as everyone else um and oh, that wow. just mean and that just means that we um like we don't some publishers don't want to work with us we don't we just felt like it was easier for us to just eschew all that completely so the beauty of it is that we're never under any embargo pressure so like i'm playing final fantasy 16 at the same time everyone else is and it's kind of fun so like our spoiler cast will be recorded next week i'm almost done with it but the game i actually got distracted because um the game gravity circuit came out late last week um if you're into side scrollers like i am um it's like a Mega Man x style game from this studio called domesticated ant and it's like really 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 great um Highly recommend it. I think after we're done here, I'll go back and beat it today, and then, and then get back to Final Fantasy so that I can uh, be ready for our podcast next week. But um, yeah, we take a lot of pride in that. I mean, I I, I sometimes imagine how big Sacred Symbols would be if we actually had um, access and early access to games. That my question to I mean, sorry to grow up because you say that no, talking, Sacred yeah. Symbols. Obviously, you as an individual, you know, you're you're known, well known. Uh, Sacred Symbols also well known. A lot of you kind of pushed a lot of people to do similar uh, things, uh, self funded uh, podcasts and grow um, organically. With the size of um, Sacred Symbols, your whole network, like, is it that you're not getting these codes? Is it pretty much by your own, you guys, their own choice? Or is, has anyone attempted to reach out to you guys, to partner with you guys? Or is this just more so if you're just keeping that because it's the best way for you uh for you yeah it's funny you say that because we just talked about this on constellation although i don't think that it's even out yet 
Um, so it's funny that it's coming up again. Um, for, we let each of our shows operate however they want. So Defining Duke keeps their connections with Xbox and the third parties and they work with them. Um, I don't know what Punching Up is going to do yet because they're kind of new. I don't even know if Nintendo really cares about the show yet. Um, when we started Sacred Symbols in 2018, we originally did work with Sony and publishers. Um, however, we started slowly getting cut off by some people um, because of my political, my so-called political leanings. <laughs> so while there were companies like Square Enix and Tecmo Koei and Bandai Namco and whoever else um, wanted, you know, Take Two, like Rockstar, they all wanted to work with us. But we were cut off by like Sony, Ubisoft and others. So in 2008, or it's actually early 2019, because I want to say it was around the time Days Gone came out, we uh, decided that we were going to cut everyone off. So over time, PR has gotten the message. We very rarely um, get PR messages. The most aggressive company, and I don't even want to say they're aggressive, they just ask every time, uh, is Tecmo Koei always comes in and is like, are you guys still not accepting codes or whatever? But we also don't accept endemic advertising either, so we don't advertise games or anything. We've probably left, I would say, hundreds of thousands of dollars on the table over the last few years um, uh, not doing that. So that's question. important to us. Yeah, yeah. You know, is it a little weird because, you know, because I would say you and Smooth have like that same people <laughs> kind of nick at you over over your political opinions. Is it weird? I'm not like, obviously, I'm not going to get like in a political uh, feel, but is it weird that foreign companies will blacklist you over stuff that really like realistically has nothing to do with them just because it's your opinion on a, a country that they're not really involved in to that degree? Yeah, it's. I don't really try to hold it, the companies against it. It's the people, you know, mm -hmm. like I know the people at Ubisoft that blacklisted me. It's not Yves Gilmont's not fucking sitting there and is you guys can curse, right? Or yes, of course. This is. Yeah. Um, OK, cool. Because I curse on Iron Lords and I get in trouble. Um, <laughs> so, no, uh, this isn't Iron Lords. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good. OK. Well, I mean, not not. I mean, I like Iron Lords. Too. I'm just, I'm just, I like to curse. Um, so there's this this, I guess, perception that um, like the companies themselves do these things. And I just don't believe it. It's even interesting with what happened to Bud Light recently with the Dylan Mulvaney thing where it wasn't like whether or not you feel like that's earned or not. I'm not even talking about that. The point is, is that like that wasn't really the company. That's just like someone at the company that made a really bad decision that ended up affecting the entire company. Yeah. So I try not to really like I'm cut off by Ubisoft and I have been for years, but I love Far Cry. Like yeah. I love all those games. I'll play them. I don't care. Platinum their games do whatever. So I try not to hold hold anyone against anyone. I just think that it's a lot of like virtue signaling and a lot of it's totally inconsistent and unfair and uncharacter and you know it's like what's so funny about the ftc situation for instance and everyone rooting for it at least on the xbox side is that like that's a vociferously republican hardcore conservative stance and you can just see that like politics i say that because like politics doesn't really matter it's about like what the the zeitgeist is at the time and like how you can take an opinion that will you know hurt another person or be on another person's side or whatever so i don't i, I guess what i'm saying is i don't really take it very personally and frankly we don't need them um, yeah. the, sh the the com the company has only grown exponentially since we cut them off. Yeah, and I would actually argue that, you know, I would agree with you when it comes to like the individual people because you see all the time, you know, popular influencers go years blacklisted by a certain company, and then like the influencer manager gets replaced, and the new person invites them back into the club. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's I I. I... I know I could probably reach out I, being at IGN for many years and then kind of funny. I have deep connections in, in video games, or at least I did in PR and a lot of the, especially Sony's PR, are a lot of the same people. And I know that if I really, 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 really wanted to like try to bury the hatchet or whatever, but we have such an adversarial yeah. relationship with each other at this point that I actually think it benefits the show a great deal. That's why I always think it's so funny when we're called fanboys and shills when the company we cover fucking hates us, like, <laughs> like refuses to deal with us. I always like to think about their and they. And with this podcast, Microsoft probably has the same situation as this podcast will grow. But, you know, low level PR people. So for Xbox, it would be like an Edelman or whatever. They listen to all this stuff. And so I always I always and they type it up and they send it into the marketing and it's in all the materials and all of that. And I always love thinking about how people have to listen to everything I say and then <laughs> and then relay it along to the, to the PR people. <laughs> Yeah, man. Um, no, no. That, that, I, I'm, I'm happy you cleared it up because I was just curious. I was like, I was like, I don't understand how uh, you know someone could get to a certain height and then not get access. So I was like, at some point, it's got to be some sort of mutual decision or like. And if that's the stance you guys taking, salute to you. I'm sorry. I'm probably going to be like <laughs> the first sellout possible. <laughs> no, I, I, I think I don't think there's anything wrong with having connections. I just honest, honestly, my whole take was. Because I totally under first of all, dude, I I had major connections and played them up for many years. Like, 
I wonder if I and I actually that's what we were saying on on Constellation was if I was a novice or like in a greenhorn in this space, I wouldn't be doing this. I have experience and money and and you know all this stuff like I, I have the the luxury of not being like, being like I don't give a fuck about any of these connections and I really don't but I think that if I was in an earlier part of my part of my career not only would I have acted differently but that would have helped me and that's why like the whole fiasco that I somehow got got sucked into even though I didn't say anything about p- people taking pictures with executives I'm like dude I I probably have I've gone to dinner with Shuhei Yoshida in Tokyo many like several times you know I've I've gone to all these different events I've been to dinner with Media Molecule I've been to dinner with Insomniac I've been invited to all these different places that's part of being in the media so I didn't I never really looked at that as a bad thing and without having that experience I would have never been able to make this choice which is why I think it's really important to to point that out if that makes sense so so quick question you know let's bring yeah. that up real quick before we get to the abk stuff because i i'm being infected by this and so it's called you know we we have a picture of us and aaron Greenberg being shared around twitter uh do you think that where do you think is the line because here here might be personally if you have a relationship with people that's fine it's when you are hiding that relationship it's when you're trying to act like it doesn't exist and that's where i feel like stuff gets a little shady at that point because you know, especially when you're doing sponsorships, that's why the that's why it's illegal to not disclose that mm-hmm. information. Where do you think the line is with having a relationship with companies before you would consider yourself drawing that crossing that line? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that as long as you go, I think being friendly and being friends with people is good. I think rubbing elbows as a journalist was very beneficial to me. Um, you getting contact, creating trust. I think what you have to realize is that nine out of 10, probably 59 or if I'm sorry, 49 out of 50 times, they don't really care about you. And I would argue that you don't really care about them either, right? Like you're using each other for something. And as long as you can kind of, it doesn't mean you have to be mean to each other. It doesn't mean you can't have dinner or drinks. It's just, I think people kind of overstate. It's like, oh, so I went out to dinner with Shuhei Yoshida. And so like Shuhei Yoshida and I are best friends. I'm like, I don't think so. Like when Sony PR cut me off, Shuhei Yoshida hasn't said a word to me. You know, it's it's not like we were like that that transcended that reality, if that makes any sense. So I try to really keep that in in yeah. mind that I think that people it's, it's what I've said many times about my time at IGN when people think there's like crazy payola and all this untoward stuff going on. I'm like, I can honestly tell you that that isn't true. Like, it, I'm just telling you it's not true. Like your worst case scenario stuff is often not not true. And in fact, those connections probably help lubricate the wheels to get you content, get you interviews, all that kind of stuff. And there are people over time that I've become personal friends with where I feel like the audience needs to know that. And my, my mm-hmm. audience does. I'm very, uh, I'm very friendly with people like Ken Levine, who I consider a personal friend. Neil Druckmann is a personal friend, all these different things. And so over time, you, and Insomniac is a studio, for instance, I was, and it was mutual thing at IGN after Resistance 3 came out, which I didn't review. I was basically cut off from covering them because I had written the history of the studio, like an extensive history of the studio and was very, very getting very close to them. So you have to also know when to cut yourself off from whether or not you can be objective, but whether or not you can also look at the audience and wonder or understand how they think you're objective or not. And so I think that playing those, you know, playing the optic game is very important. And yeah, yeah, so I think I think that's the the most important thing. There is a big difference between being friendly with business associates and actually having a friend like most of the time, if that relationship ended, that's when the friendship would end. You know, you guys are friendly with each other. Uh, I do have some friends that I, I would generally consider a friend, but there are definitely a huge portion of people. It's like that's a business associate. That's a, it doesn't go anything beyond that. Right. And and I think that like when I think about all the people I've met and interfaced with, it's I've only pulled a few of them with me into my into my real world, you know, Um and I think that's just the way it works wherever you are. I'm sure that's it's not really exclusive to video games. So and the reason I bring up big names is not because those are the only people I'm friends with or friendly with. It's just because those are the only names that even matter. If I, I, I'm friends with people in the trenches, sure, but that's not even people you you really interface with. Um, so like when I get married this fall and Gio Corsi will be at my wedding, for instance, it's like that's not going to be a huge surprise because we became friends when I was covering Sony, you know, but it really didn't affect the relationship. It's just it's just friendship. That's why I. I wasn't bummed that people were having that discourse. I was wondering why I was pulled into it. You know, like I never said anything about people not taking pictures with executives and all that. So I have no idea why the hell people were making me into the punching bag on that one. I think it's it's because you were on on the episode of with um, Jaffe. I was on the episode when they they talked about it, but it was clipped. But it was clipped out without me, without even hearing what I said, which is which was explaining a lot of what I just explained. So it's just uh, that's why I hate 
people always say like why do you only show clips share clips of you talking on your show I'm, like, <laughs> I'm, like, I'm afraid of clipping anyone out because i am always clipped out so i'd rather just do it to myself um and deal with the consequences but when those kinds of things go around and then it's like a three-hour podcast in which we discussed all of the things that we just discussed but you yeah. only clip out that one part then i get the heat and it's like okay i don't but I never said that you shouldn't do that. I, I was telling the story about how Shuhei Yoshida brought me to dinner at the place where Kill Bill was filmed, right? Like that, that place crazy... did look familiar. Was <laughs> it that picture that was shared on Twitter? Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. There's probably because I probably have five thousand pictures of me and Shuhei Yoshida. Yeah, you know? like I'm not kidding. Like we interviewed him every E3, every Tokyo Game Show, probably twice a year. Interstitials. He would be on podcast beyond. It's like this wasn't. That's why what I see those pictures circulating. I'm like, dude, if you look hard enough. You'll find a lot more than that. I mean, have fun. I don't give a shit because I, I never said anything. <laughs> so just to uh, cap off, so I haven't like my gaming has been I just been dabbling in little things. I'm preparing to play um, Exo Primal. Um, I guess every time I mention that game, because I did get a code from Capcom. Thanks for supplying the code. Um, I haven't started it yet. I'll probably uh do something with it i've been hearing some reactions looks cool my son got to, to play it on um game pass but he's a big like jurassic park fan How so your son? he's 10 10 so that's probably a good age for extra prime i would i mean it's probably rated t yeah no it's I, ready I, I had to give him approval to play so <laughs> but this dinosaur so uh he's he was excited so he kind of got like i kind of got a little teaser of what he was doing so i'm looking forward to get it uh to uh, getting started um and capcom they've been you know on a good stretch for a little while so i i don't have a, any reason to believe it's uh um it's a, it's a bad game but w we shall see uh, i've been playing a lot on the road ally um just trying out different games on it um it's became like a you know, little decent uh device uh that it's pretty much became like my de facto xbox handheld honestly um and i beat the game uh bramble on it um so it, it did very good there um i'm not sure if you are familiar with the rogue um um colin but um i know it kind of had like this you know week where everybody you know wanted to get their hands on it and um I mean, it's it's still holding up. So um, I know a lot of people want to treat it as a like a, a decent alternative. I'm not the battery life is it's just not for it, <laughs> not for it. I, it's the point where I won't even download like a traditional game that I would play on a console because it's it's not worth it. If I'm games I play like that, I would do like a like three, four hour playtime through. I won't download on a rogue. I would. This is where I download games like uh hi-fi rush or uh freaking battle tools or the game you mentioned there was the side uh the game you mentioned earlier it would be oh, something circuit yeah, yeah i would play on that for sure yeah um that, like realistic those would be the best games honestly to try uh, on it not those like you know you, you don't want to go play in hogwarts legacy or anything like that on it it's just it's just overkill you'll only get like 40 minutes of time before that you have to plug it in but um other than that uh let's Get into the Patreon questions. A lot of people, this is the most questions we've gotten uh, so far uh, since we launched. And just to remind everybody, you know, uh, Wep um, Play Xbox is officially part of the Weapon Will Network. This is the show is coming to you exclusively through the Weapon Will Patreon. So shout out to Weapon Will. And um, you guys make this show uh, possible the way that it is. Yeah, you guys are making like a little like a little network of shows, right? It's pretty it's pretty cool to see. I think a, I think a high tide raises all boats. So I think it's it's good. Like the more the merrier, in my opinion. So keep it up. Awesome. It's awesome. Now, as, again, like I said, you started something. Uh, I mean, I don't know if it's wrong for me to give you the credit for it, but I guess based off the pool of content that I watch, I'm giving you the credit because I don't know. Maybe other people did it and just wasn't part of my watch circle yeah, i don't know like, so... I, I think i think more last stand i think is influential in its own way but i actually think co-founding kind of funny was probably the more influential yeah. thing on, on the yeah on the scene for sure absolutely and i keep forgetting that you <laughs> you were a part of that and then it was that that launched from there you yeah, launched cls there for two two years and two yeah. months or so yeah all right so uh first question it comes from uh Dwayne carter he says in the past, we've seen Activision release licensed games for characters like Ninja Turtles, Transformers, and Spider-Man. Do you think that relationship that Activision had in the past can help Microsoft with exclusive licensed games in the future? Um, 
I don't know how to um, answer that. I know I, when I was looking through Activision's games, uh, like historically, I was like, all right, what could possibly launch? Like pretty much I was thinking, thinking about Bethesda when they closed the deal and then all these games came launched into Game Pass or they all they started FPS boosting a, a ton of like Bethesda games. I'm thinking about, I was like, okay, outside of Call of Duty, what else could we that can go into the subscription that I would like immediately download and I'm looking at their catalogs like damn a lot of these games are like licensed games that I don't even know no, ex- no longer exists yeah. so, so uh, in that case and some of those licenses have now been either renegotiated or owned by like you know Sony or the likes of EA Ubisoft whatever depending on who the um because they did a lot of uh they did a lot of uh, Disney uh stuff for a while I know they did the Transformer stuff uh, but it is a good question because one of the things that Microsoft is severely lacking um, is the license. They don't they don't have like the pop culture mm. games like, you know, obviously PlayStation is able to secure like Spider-Man and now Wolverine and they got uh, they get partnerships w- with the Star Wars games and stuff like that. So those those big names and Xbox, I guess Indiana Jones is the only one by default that they was able to acquire, but they don't have anything in an equivalent like a DC or a Marvel or whomever um but i think that's a good question with your you know extent like history in the industry and 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 being able and with some of these people um do you think activision would a lot pretty much it could assist microsoft in getting some of these licenses since they've had extensive deals in the past yeah i think i don't know that it'll matter like the specific deals they had because for instance you were bringing up some of the great licensed games like uh, and some of them not so great but like raven made that wolverine game for instance that was awesome on a ps3 that was like a really great game and that was in the period when they made singularity as well and they did and everything was kind of going really well and then they got into the call of duty factory and we never saw them again um but i think uh with things like the old game so there's like spider-man marvel ultimate alliance and, and some of the other games you noted i'm not sure that like that's going to specifically help you what my interpretation is and the sony is acting this way with their playstation productions tv and movies Um, deals is that it seems like license holders want to dance with everyone and I don't blame them I think that's really great so I think just the virtue of being Activision just the virtue of being Microsoft now being this combined entity with a lot of power and a lot of pull I think will just attract general licensing so I don't know if like that history of specific like you know so for instance Marvel I don't know if that's really gettable for them now you know Um, ironically that was apparently offered to them uh, and and I don't think that Xbox saw the the value in that although I I don't know how substantiated that rumor is that that's what yeah. i want to point out is yeah. it doesn't matter what kind of relationship activision has if xbox and microsoft don't want to pursue those relationships it then it doesn't matter at that point and it's it's up to because look does activision have extensive you know relationship with these companies yeah but i wouldn't go on a limb i would go on a limb and say that microsoft has a lot of these similar relationships they could easily pull as well it's just they chose not they choose not to for some reason yeah, I think I think some of them are different. Like some I, I don't know that Microsoft would be as well connected in arts and entertainment as a company like Sony. I think that that helps lubricate things a little bit. But I think that money money talks and Microsoft can throw around money and get whatever they want. And obviously, I mean, it happened before they own Bethesda and Zenimax. But um, the Indiana Jones thing is, is, is just what I'm talking about, about people wanting or I shouldn't say people, organizations and entities wanting to kind of split the difference. And I had brought up Sony and PlayStation Productions as a good example everything they're doing is going totally different places, like almost diametrically opposed places. One thing goes to HBO, one thing goes to Peacock, one thing goes to Amazon, one thing goes to Netflix. This is literally how it's all working. Like, I think Netflix has Horizon, Amazon has God of War. Then they're going to the films and doing all these things. I just think that Microsoft and Activision will naturally and should naturally be the beneficiary of just a series of licenses based on companies wanting to split their assets up. So it would be interesting if they got an exclusive Star Wars game. It would be interesting. If they, but here, here's where I think things get a little complicated for Microsoft, although they can afford to do whatever they want, is that I think doing business with these companies is going to cost Microsoft more money than it would cost Sony because the money is going to have to come up front. It's going to come through Game Pass. Maybe you reach certain milestones. Companies are still going to want to take their most AAA products and sell them a la carte. That's going to be much more tempting to do on a platform where people still primarily buy their games and, and don't um, haven't yet, let's say, bought into a subscription system. 
And so you think about licensed companies like the cross media companies that are dealing a lot with the, the drama that's going on in streaming and TV and movies right now and how how horrifying that scene is right now and how everyone's on strike and the money's not there and all of that. And I think they realize that they don't necessarily or aren't necessarily going to want to do business in a parallel way. Um, but I don't, I don't know if that will end up turning out or not. Well, let's see. Hopefully they can work out something again, because some of those games that are like those early Xbox One or, um, 360 area games, I would like to, you know, play for sure. Do, do you guys think that if Microsoft, like if they don't want to go after what the mainstream is now, I would say the only other alternative is to make the stuff they have mainstream, like make a good Halo show, make a good Doom movie or good doom show to to bring those to the highlights or yeah fallout's it, coming right yeah fallout like but to me it's like when you look at something like the halo tv show to me it didn't feel like a halo tv show like no one's talking in 2023 how good halo was i feel i feel like especially after seeing the last of us and even a lot of the issues i had with the last of a show that was substantially better show than the halo show and, and it's just like to me it's like that mainstream is extremely important. You got to try to get something to connect you with like the casual market. Spider-Man, Wolverine, huge examples of it. It's like, and it's, can we have a consistent where we're knowing two or three years down the line, these games are still going to be exactly where they're at. It's, I think that's why Sony gets so much passes. Like they can have a game completely flop on a Redfall level, but people are like, but they've shown us enough quality in the past that we can put this as the outliner and not the, the norm. Yeah. Yeah. I think I just laid this out on sacred too, that I think consistency is everything. And I think this will now win the day, especially if you have subscription services, which seems to be like a, a coming trend, then consistency is literally going to be everything. Cause it's going to be all about monthly active users and um, retaining that upward curve. So um, the, the thing that I think kind of gets lost in everything is that it's difficult to make games consistently. It's really expensive to make games consistently. And um, I laid out a, a vision for PlayStation f through my eyes where through first, second, and third party, they could come up with a game for single player audiences perhaps every 10 weeks. And if they were able to do that, then they could do whatever they wanted with games as a service and the, they wouldn't alienate their old school heart, uh, fan base that's very scared of what's going on right now. Plus, they can go after all the money that they know they can get. 100% of instead of 30% of like they see with Genshin Impact and, and the like. I hear you. All right, so let's um let's move on. I don't know what's going on with Smooth, but the show must go on. We'll talk with, he said, my question is for Colin, how do you think the ABK deal will affect Game Pass going forward? Do you think it will help the service become more successful or not? Probably mid to long term, I think it will have a huge effect on Game Pass. I think in the short term, it's probably going to have less of an effect because I think it's going to be a while before they are really able to do what they want to do with it. I think 2025 will be the um, the first year that Call of Duty will actually be on Game Pass. And so I think that once that happens and once you can turn that on, and then I'm very curious to see what Sony does in that situation. Um, do they want to put the game on PS Plus? I mean, that seems to be an option for them. And uh, so... I think the midterm and obviously the long term is going to be very beneficial for Game Pass to have Activision. I think it makes a lot. I, again, this is why I never made an economic or like legal argument. Not that I'd be able to do those things when I'm a lawyer or anything, but I never made those kinds of arguments against Game Pass because um, I don't know that what Microsoft is doing is unnatural, unusual, or like a bad idea. Actually, if that makes sense, I more make the creative. And uh, I guess I do make an economic argument from making games, but from Microsoft's point of view, the acquisition of uh, Activision, Blizzard, King should be massively beneficial in the mid and long term for um, for their stuff and for their subscription service. And then I think in the short term, they just have to kind of bite the bullet, flatten the companies. And or I, I know they want to leave Activision alone to do its own thing. I don't think that's going to be super realistic in the sense of headcount. I think that probably will, will be maybe some redundancies and they have to figure out how these companies all fold into each other. And so that's going to be a problem in the short term. And obviously they're taking on all of that money that they, they have to actually it's a lot pay. Of overhead. To yeah. The overhead is insane. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot of overhead that, that just 
the the sixty nine billion or how much it is. Like it doesn't end there. They they got to cover all their salaries from here going forward. All their their health care. Like the overhead is absolutely insane. Like, sorry, and, um, I'm sorry. from an economic point of view for themselves and to build Game Pass up. That's why obviously Activision won't be the last thing they buy. I think that they do. I think that there is. I'd be I'd be interested to know if there is any danger for them or perceived danger if they go too far. Like they buy too much, they consolidate too much. People are wondering what they're doing. Um, so I think they do need to think, let things sit for a little while with Activision. But I think that you know this is just probably the beginning for them. And I'm sorry, please. No, don't go ahead and finish. Yeah, and I, and I was just going to say I I think that from if I were at Microsoft, if I were in charge of doing things, if I had decision making possibilities, I mean this is something I would have done. If this is if this is the course we would have you know if this is the course with Game Pass and subscriptions kind of eschewing a la carte sales and sacrificing some of that at the author of subscriptions, then you have to, by virtue of that, either pay for the content or consolidate around the content and protect your access to it. So um, so from their point of view, I've I've never really questioned the deal at all. I just question whether it's good for the industry or not, but that's another topic. Yeah, I agree. I actually don't think that they'll go after another big publisher such as like an Activision. I don't think Ubisoft, EA. There's no one left. And, I mean, yeah, I, <laughs> those companies I are think... all magnitudes of orders. You know, like Ubisoft is way smaller than, you know, than Activision, for instance. So I don't think there's anything even left for them to do. You know, I think it's just I think, unfortunately, this just makes Sony more aggressive. You know, sorry, guys, you... for like Tedo Air. What, uh, at a, I'm assuming this was a question from Jack Wiz or, that or you oh, want on uh, where he says, yeah. oh, oh, this is the wonton soup question. About yeah. the, do you think will service become more um, successful? Yeah, yeah, I said that. Okay. I, I said that in, in the short term, it's probably irrelevant. In the mid and long term, it's hugely beneficial. Um, just because they have to get through that. If Call of Duty is the big keystone of this, which it is, obviously, they're really not going to be able to put it on Game Pass until twenty twenty five. So it's going to take time for them. So I think that fall. I think it's going to be a great time for that. I think you have something like Starfield coming out that's going to be big for Game Pass. Although I don't understand why you wouldn't just buy that game. You know, it's it's huge, seventy dollars just, and then you don't have to worry about your subscriptions. You can own it. But um, regardless, they have this uh, this value that's already heavily coming with a big role playing game from a very well respected studio like Bethesda. So the value is already coming and it's being compounded. I think by the time you get to twenty twenty five, it's going to be an overwhelming value because they'll finally be able to open up Call of Duty. And that's I was saying you weren't here, but. Uh, I am curious what Sony does with Call of Duty at that point. Like, do they'll have the option to put it on PS Plus? Will they pay to do that, or will they take the sales? I suspect that they're going to take the sales because I think MLB The Show, although a much less important game, still is an explosive seller in the United States and in Western Europe to a lesser degree. Um, even though Xbox, even though it's on Game Pass, it's still one of the best selling games in the United States. So I think that they might look at that and say, like, well, we might be able to have it both ways. I just think it sucks for them from their perspective that you know, a bunch of, you know, 70% of these rips are going to now their primary competitor. So again, with that, right, because it's, it's curious, right? So next year is the last marketing year mm -hmm. for PlayStation and Call of Duty. Um, and around that time, maybe 2025 is, I expect, the new look battlefield to come in. Do you think Sony are in talks with EA or should they be in talks with EA to sort of pivot to for for the loss of Call of Duty, not that they could lose access to the game, but in terms Just of having the game right. to market with. Yeah, I, I think EA is probably going to be a, a tantalizing partner for them with Battlefield if DICE really can turn things around. It seems like we're in a pretty soft period um, with Battlefield in some sense. I think it got a little better after the last game's release as they fix things, but um, I'm much I think a lot of people are more confounded in the PlayStation space and maybe they have and they're just being quiet about it and they have in a way with deviation which failed and and maybe with Haven and others but have you been investing your money and maybe making your own shooter again is there a potential for a kill zone revival which is unlikely especially based on what Gorilla was recently saying about the franchise but um a resistance revival or something like that that could work for them too so I think that there's like two different fronts for them to fight on but I think that Sony's best bet is to continue to buy the milk and not the cow. And so like deals for marketing with games like Battlefield are going to be very tantalizing, especially um, because they can still lean for the time being on strong a la carte sales that big publishers really like. 
and deem necessary for the creation of their style of game. So it's going to be a more tempting place actually to do business if the subscription model continues to deviate the two the two systems from each other, which I think is good because then the economy can figure out or the market can figure out you know what I, wins. I'm actually kind of curious, Colin and uh, Smooth. I definitely to, uh, tune in on this. For the lo- last, I would say, generation, Microsoft has primarily been that big, partnership with with ea marketing like uh you know all the battlefields just about now that they'll get the call of duty marketing rights i would say they will abandon that or do you think they'll try to market both of those games so sony can't get it like i'm just kind of curious how having the call of duty marketing rights affects how microsoft has generally marketed games in the past before when it comes to shooters yeah well i mean you might it's so funny that we're locked into this zone of call of duty being associated with playstation because i think you guys are have been gaming for well long enough to know that e3 press conferences for xbox used to open with the new call of duty right like yeah that was and not that basically long ago, yeah right like that was Ghost a, was the last one right no and, advanced warfare oh advanced warfare okay. yeah and so i think that like that was an event like that was a tradition we knew what was coming at the beginning of the press conference they would barely even acknowledge playstation's existence this was also true with Bethesda, with games like, you know, Fallout and Skyrim, where they were much more Xbox associated, the DLC came to Fallout 3 on Xbox 360 in the beginning, like Operation Anchorage and all of that. Um, so I think that like the deal, I think these deals just vacillate back and forth between whatever entity they think they can get the most out of. And sometimes things don't work out. I always look at EA making the deal for the first Titanfall in the in the prism through the prism of the Xbox 360, not realizing they were going to get the Xbox one and how no doubt disappointed they were in that. So sometimes you take these massive risks and do that. And I think that from if I were playing from Xbox's point of view, I think it would be contradictory to our marketing to have another big first person shooter. And I would imagine from the other per, the other entity's point of view that they would not want to be marketed next to it in the same ecosystem. Yeah. They would definitely like there's no way that well, I don't want to say no way, but it would be very strange for you to ever see Battlefield co- like come day and date now to Game Pass because that would just be con- con- you know contradictory to their own needs to compete with uh, Call of Duty, not be in the you, same ecosystem as it. Yeah, I think the you, happiest publisher of this ABK deal was EA um, because it, what it does, it opens the door for them. Like maybe PlayStation Sony wasn't checking for EA for their games because they had Activision for Call of Duty and Destiny and stuff like that. But when you lose that, now they look very, very attractive. And you can, you know, ABK was able to get a you know generous deal from PlayStation. You're, I mean, they're next in line. It puts them in a a, a curious you know situation to get that backing and usually obviously you have a playstation backing as as a way to increase sales increase awareness from a franchise that has been on a decline for a while now so i think this is a perfect opportunity for them you, you know the funny thing you look at it from the perspective of you know activision has the king of the shooters the call of duty the one that outsells everything and playstation had that for so long they weren't looking at like the battlefields but now since the the uh the loser in the console generation xbox bought activision now ea is just like look now we could just pretty much by default get battlefield from here going forward like they because now at this point it's like you said colin i doubt you'll ever see xbox ever market battlefield again and so it it's puts dice in a really good situation because now they can have the the console leader constantly marketing their title unless they unless they just go with destiny i mean that that's that's point that matters about to come out hopefully here in the next year year and a half maybe by the time this activision deal things up they don't even touch battlefield they just put all their so, marketing marbles behind destiny I, and matter i have a qu- uh, i have an interesting scenario with this activision deal going through does e i don't know the the how long the the deal that xbox currently has with ea for ea play because it's bundled with game pass ultimate does that now change the ea renegotiate or do they walk away the minute the their situation expires like how do you see that relationship going because by default ea does have a marketing deal essentially with xbox because ultimate is a part of game pass i mean ea play is a part of game pass ultimate I would imagine that this is probably very similar or going to play out very similar to the Bethesda acquisition where the awkward 
um, entanglements from the previous your previous life is under a different entity are going to have to play themselves out. So, you know, with Deathloop and Ghostwire Tokyo, those were like in, that was an inconvenient. Those deals were an inconvenient truth of Microsoft acquiring ZeniMax, and they had to see them through. And we found out during the deposition and the trial with the FTC that it was a you know them chasing Starfield in the same way was a big motivator for them acquiring ZeniMax. So and those things wash out over time, right? Now Sony now. Bethesda as an entity and Microsoft are really unencumbered from those deals. And so I think EA probably has a deal for X amount of time and they probably have to ride it out. There could be some sort of clause in there saying that this would kill the deal or something, but I, I don't know that it really materially affects them. What, whether they're happy about it or not, I don't know. But, you know, in other words, like the, the deal is made under, it's like a, a contract being traded in sports. It's like you kind of just have to kind of ride it out to the end. Yep. All right, next question comes from Jack Thomas or Jacquez Thomas. I think maybe it's French. I don't know. It says, do you guys think that Xbox should acquire more studios after the Activision Blizzard deal? I only ask this because after ABK deal goes through, Xbox will have a total of 31 gaming studios. If we look at other big companies like Embracer Group, it shows that having a lot of companies can result in a lot of mismanagement in gaming studios. And with Microsoft being hands off on its gaming studios, I fear that it may result in more Red Falls or Saints Row games. Take care, gents. Colin, I've seen I, you take multiple like takes in these directions with uh, consolidation and, um, you know, Xbox buying their way, um, you know, buying talent and acqu uh, acquiring IPs and stuff. So I'm curious to get your response to this one, because Embracer Group was the they did just I don't know what happened. They acquired all these studios and they, their recent take was buying the Western portion of Square Enix. Mm -hmm. And then I guess they were in talks of a deal that was worth two billion or something. It fell through and it kind of had a crazy effect on uh, their uh, their operations, which led to massive layoffs or like budget cuts. Yeah, games being canceled and all of the rest. It was funny on Sacred Symbols. <clears throat> this was a this was something that a lot of people were giving me credit for for prognosticating very, very early when when they were doing all when they were buying all these studios. I'm like, there's just no way this works. And and uh, I was right because it's just the bigger you get, this is this is a multifaceted problem. The bigger a creative unit gets, the more facets have to be attended to. You have to have more production. You have much more overhead. You have more expectations. More products coming out. They have to interact with each other. This is a problem. I think that. Bob Iger is encountering with Disney right now with Disney, Marvel, Star Wars and all of that. And he said as much in recent interviews where they're like, we're doing we're going to do way less. And it, that's important. I think that like you need to maybe focus down and do big things, good pops every quarter, every whatever. Like I was saying earlier, I think you were off at the time I was saying if Sony can get a, a like a, an exclusive arrangement of first, second and third party games, time, third party games that are maybe every 10 weeks for single player audiences, I think that would be like the perfect pocket for them to buy to buy time with their audience while they explore games as a service and and all the rest. So I just think that um, big entities in creative fields don't tend to do well from a creative point of view. You might make money, but I don't care about that. I like the way that smaller operations um, operate when they have they're working closer to the line. This is what I was saying earlier about Sony getting the uh, buying the milk instead of uh, um, buying the cow is it's just a cheaper, safer way to do business and hedge your bets. But they also have to work from that point of view and things have to work it themselves out. That's why I've lamented that. It's not that I, and this is what I was saying earlier. It's not that I lament that Microsoft is acting in its rational self-interest as a business, you know, doubling down on game pass, uh, doubling down on, um, you know, acquiring studios and publishers and all the rest. Um, but it's that it affects the the overall economics of the industry. And I would argue that the least talented in the space of the three major hardware entities by far in gaming shouldn't be the one that is redetermining the economics of the system. That's why that's like my major concern with this, with what's happening and why consolidation is bad. Like the, the company you would want to consolidate if anyone was going to consolidate was Nintendo. You know, because at least they're like mega high quality, really focused on games, have laser vision about what, exactly what they're doing. They know it's like the company that's struggling the most by nature of surviving in the space needs to alter the economics of it. And that is natural, but it sucks at the same time. And so I think that to, to answer the question is like they are going to buy more things like I, I think that that's. I think that they feel like they have to. 
I just I'm just sad for the rest of the industry. That's also going to feel like they're going to need to consolidate. It's going to mess up all everyone's pipeline. Sony is not going to be immune. They're already making purchases that are way different than the purchases they made over a 30 year period in order to keep up. And I can only imagine what they're going to go after now. Yeah, it's going to get worse. So I think and and now we're talking about the the rational interest of Microsoft and, and understanding that, which I do. Now you have to understand the rational interest of Sony, which is like it would be suicidal for them not to go and buy a publisher. And I think that like they know what time it is and they know what the game is. And I think it's most interesting that um, that in some sense, the um, the only thing that works against them right now with buying a major entity, because people always say like they couldn't afford this, they couldn't afford that. They can really afford whatever they want. They can take out loans and get all sorts of infusions of money. They're Sony. They have an amazing leverage. Um, with all of their brands and all of the rest, but borrowing money is really expensive right now. And this circles back to what happened with Embracer because they needed that $2 billion of capital infusion into their studios. Bar- money is really expensive right now. Companies run a lot on short-term loans. That's just the way these major companies work so that they can constantly stay liquid. So everything came to a head with Embracer. The only thing that works for them now, and I think this was always the intention, I just don't think it was supposed to fold down this quickly, was they just want the IP. Like they they are a farm of IP. They own so much IP. And in fact, if I were Microsoft, Embracer would be the, the target for me. And it would have been an, it would have been a target way before Activision, because I think that Embracer has what you need, which is a volume of, frankly, a level games. And I don't yeah. say that as an insult. I just think that that you're this yeah, idea of having absolutely tri- they, this, this idea of having triple A games every week on your services is not going to happen. So it, you need to have your A level games. I would have locked down Embracer a long time ago if I were Microsoft and saw that they needed a two billion dollar lifeline. I would have been like, we'll give you the two billion dollars. Um, and in return, we're going to work something out. And all those games on Game Pass, would I think this sounds crazy, but all of Embracer's games and all of their future games would be way more important to Game Pass's success than just um, in the long term than just having the option of buy Call of Duty, I think. I think that would be much more tantalizing hey. for families, for people with long-term, first of all, people that are not into shooters, people that want to stay on the service, that like to mix through their games. So the 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 next targets for Microsoft would, would be the, the companies with the most IP, which is why I think they want Sega. And or plus, when you have this many studios as well, and you have multiple teams, it would be nice to buy a company that has the amount of IPs that, that Embracer Group has because Embracer Group has a lot of like double A games, but they have a lot of games that could easily go triple A if they wanted to. Yeah. Embracer Group uh, is I, the Walmart bin. And not yeah, to say yeah, that yeah. as a bad, but it, 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 I'm sorry, Attic. Uh, what Colin said actually, it makes sense. It's like to get to the point where, because eventually Microsoft has to get to the point where they don't have to pay third party publishers to feed Game Pass. They want to. Like how Netflix now, the majority of stuff on Netflix is now is like Netflix sort of original stuff or Netflix exclusive uh, sitcoms, Netflix exclusive movies. Game Pass has to get to that point. And, you know, obviously Activision and, uh, you know, potentially Sega, but that helps that. But Embracer Group, who pushes out what? a few games annually could yeah that that would be a smart play i just wanted to uh, chime in on that but continue on that i'm sorry yeah i think a few games is an understatement they push out a lot of games every year they should be pushing out way more and that's their problem from a double i'm sorry to interrupt you but i just wanted to throw that out there that that's like a double-edged sword it's like they are so big that they need revenue but they don't have the means to make the it's like what Square Enix did to themselves over the last year where they just released game. The only option is to thus release games on top of each other, but no one wants to buy games on top of each other. So you just you can't even release that many games. That's why they could never survive at that size. If, if Microsoft should give them their money and cut them way down, I would say take and I'm not even being facetious here. They own something like 135 studios. I'd be like, we'll take 15 of these and all of the IP, you know, and Unfortunately, that, that would, you know, none of the, the most of the studios they own are, but you would own Gearbox, you know, Saber Interactive. There's like a lot of like workhorse studios in there that would be great for Microsoft, but um, I don't think the industry widely should want that. And, and plus, I think Microsoft, particularly right now, because they keep expanding the way they do, they need support studios. Like, I, I, I'm at this point, we've seen so many issues where they have to consistently bring on other entities to help them make games fable has a studio uh, and 
uh, in the initiative just brought on Crystal Dynamics. Like it feels like every studio has another studio working with that studio right now. Well, I so, think the, I I think the initiative. I think you're right. The initiative I think was actually a really important learning lesson probably for Microsoft internally that they probably can't spool up a studio from scratch. I mean, they 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 tried to do it. Sony hasn't succeeded wildly. I mean, Pixel Up is just closed. That was spooled from scratch too. So it's not that it's it's a very difficult thing to do. They went to Santa Monica to found that studio specifically to poach from Sony Studios. So they they knew exactly what they were doing because Naughty Dog's there, Santa Monica's there, et cetera, and so on. So um, I think that we have to look at the initiative working with Crystal Dynamics as kind of saving face because that was definitely not the intention. Like They were supposed to do their own game. I know people that worked there. You know, that's what that's what's so <laughs> annoying about like that's what's so annoying about about um people talking about this. Like that wasn't weird. That was like a really this is a botched situation in a major way. It doesn't happen in the industry. <laughs> um, so, yeah. so do you think if this ABK deal wasn't a thing that Microsoft would have secured at least a Western part of Square Enix for Crystal Dynamics and XL? Because I feel like I <laughs> It, it would only make sense for that to me. If I known Square Enix was trying to get rid of Crystal Dynamics and Adios Montreal, or whatever, and, and their IP, I'm like the only logical partner would have been Microsoft to take at least those the Western side. And I thought what would happen is they would sell off the Western side to uh, Xbox, and then Sony will acquire the rest of this uh, Square Enix, and that would be it. But yeah, well, they have a connection. I mean, a pretty intimate like third party connection back when third party exclusives were okay back when when rise of the tomb raider happened um they worked with each other on that and so you think that there would be some sort of uh of connection between them but and i thought that that would be a logical place for them to land too embracer i think just used a lot of capital to jump over a really good deal square enix just doesn't want anything to do with i think with a lot of these western properties anymore it's just not what their strength is i think that i don't know this in this interest in People have that, and Microsoft certainly with Sega and, and even Square Enix, it it's it's still hard for me to believe that any of those companies would truly sell to Microsoft. I think that they would. I think some of them obviously would, and I think money is it makes anyone pliable. But that's kind of like a wholesale abandonment of their core audience that doesn't play on those console that on that on that ecosystem. You know, um, I would be very interested to see how that would go. Like in a hypothetical, let's say, uh, you know, Microsoft ends up buying Sega, and treats them kind of like a Bethesda kind of entity. It's like, well, how does your home audience feel about that? Um, it's very similar, maybe in a more microcosm with Tango Gameworks, you know, um, although they got their game on PlayStation with um, with Ghostwire. So I don't know. I, I just, I don't think anyone should be, I think Microsoft buying more property or more license, um, I'm sorry, more studios is a, a logical thing for them to want to do. I just don't see why anyone else would want them to do that. Yeah, and plus, you know, you see that some of these studios, the people working in them, it's not that they didn't want to work for Microsoft, but I would say because the moment that time limit is up, you start seeing the head studio of uh, Tango leave. Like, clearly, they were there for that paycheck. And the moment that time ran out, they're like, we out. Yeah, you, so vest, it, you, you vest, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I, feel, I, I like this next question. Uh, you know, let, let me get this unbalanced. He says, with the presumed success of Microsoft's acquisition of ABK, is Phil Spencer forgiven for Xbox's past failures? Also, which effect, if any, does the acquisition have on Jim Ryan's reputation since being appointed head of PlayStation? Um, I don't know that this really affects Jim Ryan at all. I think you have to... We, we make fun of Jim Ryan all the time on our show. I actually think Jim Ryan got a buff because he almost derailed the shit the, the damn thing yeah i think well i think i think it's a great point and i think that for, well there's a few things to say is first of all we're pretty rough on jim ryan on sacred symbols we're the ones that coined cry and jim which we think is a really funny name and that obviously came to uh to a head when we found out he was really trying to readily interfere with the the acquisition and all of that and i think that that was the idea the entire time the i the overwhelming legal analysis towards the case was such that the outcome was obvious that Sony would have to employ inept lawyers that only fed them bullshit for them not to also know that. So I think that they were just trying to buy themselves as much time and make it as frustrating and as annoying as possible. And I think that they've succeeded in doing that. Um, but I think what's important with Jim Ryan, and there are different leaders of PlayStation at different times, and some of them are businessmen and some of them are like players of games. So you have like Jack Trenton, who was like a real, just a businessman straight up. 
And Sony did okay with him. And there was good and bad times with that. And then you had someone more like Sean Layden that came from production and um, from development and worked on games like Vib Ribbon and all sorts of random shit early on. And so like he had this like real connection to game development. And I think now we're back with someone who understands the money side, which is important of the industry. And so that's very important to Sony. For instance, they Naughty Dog is always run by a co-presidents, co-presidency. So that one side deals with the business and one side deals with the creative. And so now we're back. The pendulum is swinging back, swinging back towards the business. And I don't think that if you own Sony shares or work at PlayStation or make these games or looking at the numbers, you would be very disappointed in how Jim Ryan's doing. I mean, PlayStation is absolutely murdering. Um, consoles are selling briskly at an historic pace. Operating income is at an all time high. Users at an all time, you know, between consoles at an all time high, even things like PlayStation Plus which I really think has, I mean, it has good value as a back catalog, but I don't use it. Um, I think that that's doing really respectably. Their games are selling really well. We just wrote, we just talked deeply about Horizon. I mean, those two games sold 33 million copies. That's like nothing to, nothing to sneeze at. So I think that if you're a hard money numbers man, like, like Jim Ryan is, and you're not, you know, like that famous picture of him holding the controller wrong. Like he's obviously not a player of games, but I just don't know that it matters. Sometimes strong creative is balanced by a strong business sense. And um, I think now it's going to matter about how he net. This is a very, this is a very um, dangerous time for them, for Sony. They have to navigate these waters very carefully in the next couple of years. And so I think that will ask me this question in two years and we'll see how I feel about Jim Ryan then. Well, what would you consider Phil Spencer a businessman or a gamer? Or you think he might be like in the middle, like a hybrid between the two? Um, maybe a hybrid, but I think pro- I mean he obviously has great business sense, but I would consider him more of like a like a Sean Layden type. Like I think that I think Phil Spencer un- fundamentally understands video games. I think Phil Spencer Phil Spencer understands how they're made. I think he, you know, I think that that's in his fabric to a greater degree. Um, do I think that like he's the man for the job? I don't know about that but i like one of the interesting things about the activision acquisition i don't know how how do you guys feel about this i say this on sacred people think this is crazy but part of the beauty of bar of getting activision is you acquire all of their contracts like i would take most of their c-suite and fire most of active most of xboxes i would take activision's leadership is far more talented you know imagine like imagine if bobby kotick didn't have all of his baggage what he would do as the head of xbox i mean he bought Activision out of bankruptcy for five hundred thousand dollars, and, tur- <laughs> and turned it and turned it into what it is today. That's that I am I am so tempted by. Where I'm like, I wonder if they're looking at that, like looking at the whole. You can't take Bobby Cody because all the baggage, but could you take any of that other leadership and that talent? That's my bigger problem with Phil Spencer is that I think, and I think a lot of people feel like, I, especially neutral observers wonder like how people like him and Matt Booty and others like survived so long, you know, I, but. I feel like Microsoft needs more checks and balances. I, I I don't think that, especially quality. Like, I get that Microsoft wants like hands hands off approach, but it's like only give the hands off approach to people that have res- have have earned that hands off approach. And and still, even then, you know, check in like every six months and like let me see what you got going on. But you know, uh, companies that I I feel have it earn that opportunity and show it as quality games. They don't even need to be double A, triple A, or just, just talent that produces good games. It's like, until you get to that point, it's like, you need to go over there as much as you can just to check on your investment. And I think, I think Microsoft, I personally feel like they they've expanded way too fast. And I think they're like, there used to be a check and balance system there, but it was only designed for Xbox. Now you got Bethesda. Okay, now how do you communicate between Bethesda and Xbox? Like, if, if the Bethesda people are checking on stuff, trying to fix it in house before Xbox sees it, is Xbox ever going to see it to its late? Because I think that's perfect example. Redfall. How f- much of that did Xbox know till it was too late? Did did Bethesda try to t- try to keep that sh- try to fix it before it before it got out of hand? It is. Am, I don't. I'm not entirely convinced that that issue is going to be remedied after they buy uh, Blizzard, Activision, and King. Because Bethesda is equivalent to just one of those entities on ABK. And you mean to tell me you're going to not manage one publisher, which is Bethesda, technically Xbox Game Publishing Studio, and that's another one. So they'll be managing four to five publishers. 
Well, and, and to me, that's a lot. To be fair, though, and Colin, correct me if I'm wrong on this one, but like Zenimax and ABK will still exist as they are, as separate businesses just under the Microsoft umbrella. So whoever's running them now, I mean, who knows what Bob, Bobby K, whatever, like the people that are running Zenimax when they were independent is still technically running Zenimax now. And they just they have a parent company and it will be the same thing with ABK It's like they're still going to be self publishing games. It's just they have a parent company. So like, I don't think like the Red Falls and, and whatever ABK does next is going to be at the fault of really like Microsoft. I mean, yeah. Redfall, I believe in my, from what I heard was still part of that initiative when Zenimax was trying to do online live service game, like the Fallout 76 era. And uh, when they did the Young Bloods and stuff like that, that was a, a, re- a receipt of that. It was probably like the last batch of those type of games. But tomorrow, I don't think like, even though yeah, Microsoft has their own, you know, studio management issues, I don't think, that that is a thing that's just going to spill over into ABK or, or Zenimax because their core is still really intact. Like Pete Hines is still there, even though Xbox has Aaron Greenberg and they they got they all got their own marketing departments. Now I do hope that whatever Activision's marketing team is does come over and take over, you know, the Xbox marketing uh, side of things. Um, that's like one of the things I hope like transitions over. But Activision uh, definitely knows how to how to market games. I'll, I'll give you that. I just I just feel like there could be better checks and balances. Uh, I feel like something like Redfall, and I'm sure you can agree, Colin. That game should never have seen the light of day. And if it was on the PlayStation spectrum. I'm confident they'd have canceled it. They wouldn't have let that go get that game go out there and just and just destroy their whole reputation. Because look, did it demolish the Xbox reputation? No, there's plenty of other games that maybe not have did just as bad as Redfall, but no one game is going to ruin a reputation. But if you get enough of these bastards together, that's when you start to really see the writing on the wall. And to me, Sony never would have let that out because they have a better checks and balances system in their company. I agree with that. I mean, we did say that on our show that I think that Redfall would have gotten canceled uh, on PlayStation. But I think it I it's not like a like a, a snooty thing on their from their point of view. It's like you said, like they can't afford to put out bad games. They probably would have identified that earlier in the pipeline than letting it get so deep. I mean, remember that they are delaying potentially indefinitely the Last of Us's factions game based on feedback from Bungie. I mean, they it, they're afraid of games not even we all know the game's going to be good enough. What they're worried is if the game has a long enough tail, I say like, who cares what, whatever happened to the game where you play it for a few months and you move on with your life. Why does everything have to be permanent? It's annoying. Um, but I think that generally speaking, I, 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 I see both of your guys points of view. I think that generally speaking, your pipeline. So let's assume, I, I mean, this kind of, this is kind of a weird mental exercise, but like, let's assume it takes five years for a triple a game to come out now. For a studio to work for five years and you want one like every quarter so that would give you like what you would really need assuming every team worked on one game which is not always true obviously is that you would want like only 20 teams i think that this is this is what i keep lamenting on sacred symbols is that like i said earlier from a corporate point of view sony would be suicidal to not look around and say like what can we do to get you know square enix or whatever um ubisoft properties or whatever might be for sale um and they actually said, uh, Hiroki Totoki, the um, the president of Sony, recently said in an interview that they are especially have their eyes especially peeled on on um, IP. So they might not even really be going after studios. And I think that there's some level of understanding that you actually don't need too much bloat because your games start competing with each other. You your games start coming out on top of each other. Sony's mission, I think, is just much different than Microsoft's. Microsoft's mission is to have as much content as possible. I think Sony's mission is to like balance the creation of games at 150 200 250 million dollars sell 5 to 10 million 15 million 20 million copies of those games do that three or four times a year and kind of hope for the best because i think that's all they can really afford to do if they need to get into the subscription race at some point with day and date games which i don't think will ever really happen because i think that would really change the optics of if playstation could even exist as a company at that point um or as an entity within sony at that point because games are so expensive to make um I think that as long as they can keep the status quo, that there's no real reason for Sony to grow. And that's why I feel like from an artistic point of view, I really lamented because I know that Sony is going to get bigger. It's already gotten bigger with a few studios that don't make sense. 
um as i've as i've reiterated many 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 times in the past sony simply did not buy any studios that it did not first work with between the launch of the ps1 and the launch of the ps5 ever not once and that's a big deal like that shows that they have a very specific way of doing things or did have a very specific way of doing things they target companies they make second party relationships some of them you can see get aborted over time like level five in a different timeline would have been a sony studio quantic dream in a different timeline would have been a sony studio we always thought things like insomniac and housemark would never happen because it just took so long for them to happen but then you see studios come in where we call them the one night stand acquisitions on sacred symbols like um like haven uh where it's like well we fund we're funding your game as a second party we kind of like you you kind of you know you're kind of hot i guess we'll just put a ring on this now and we'll figure it out later that was never the way sony operated and so you can already see sony breaking out of the way they used to do things and we don't know what the outcome of that which is why i was saying earlier the next two years i think will be pivotal for jim ryan because we're going to start seeing some of the fruits of this new approach and if they're not laden first and foremost with single player high quality triple a games that sell five to ten to fifteen million copies i think they're going to you're going to be in a little trouble in the mid to long term yeah I hear you um so this next question is kind of interesting i think uh this would be a good conversation uh question from alex king colin question about the field when it comes to multiplayer games do you have any faith in the live service ones a few of us feel like the old guard of arena shooters are lacking severely in the multiplayer game department yeah i don't know like, first of all, I don't, I don't, I personally don't play multiplayer games. Like I was saying earlier, I wouldn't even have PS plus at all. If it wasn't for cloud saving, I don't care about it. Wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> I forgot um, about I, that. Yeah. I, I don't, uh, I just play single player games. So, but so that's why PlayStation's always been really like a, a great place for me, especially the last, since I would say, you know, the end of the PS2 generation all the way through to today. Um, it's good for a player like me, but Sony sees the money and the writing on the wall with the need for a multiplayer games as a service. They obviously have 12 of them, as they famously said in development. I think those will range from the, I think they define that pretty broadly. I think, I think hell divers, for instance, is going to be one of those games or it considered one of those games. I think it looks awesome. Yeah. And then MLB, the show I think is even considered one of those games and so on and so forth. But, um, out of those, I think will come a few products that maybe maybe will be sticky, and I think they'll come from different genres. Th this is why I thought that Jim Ryan doing an interview, I think he did with GQ a few months ago, was a good idea. Where he talked a lot about this, where he was saying, because I, I think he they saw that there was this bubbling of assumptions about what games as a service means, and I think they're they were saying like when we say this, we don't specifically mean Fortnite or something like that. I don't, and so I'm very curious to see what hills they choose to fight on there are like a bunch of them right you have like your battle MLB royales and MMO, right. yeah and, and horizon apparently ncsoft is making a horizon mmo right so um so they intend on being there that would certainly be one of those games as a service as well and i just i'll be i'll be curious where they choose to fight and then which games stick and which games don't i assume that they really only care about one or two of them even sticking because that's all you need you have, Right. Yeah, that's it. I mean, I totally agree. Fortnite prints billions of dollars a year. I mean, to put that in the context, uh, that's, you know, if, if, if you make $2 billion in profit on Fortnite, that's literally 10 The Last of Us Part II's budgets, right? And you made that in profit on one game as a service for one year. And that's not just one year of those games development. That's their entire development, you know? So, so that's why I keep t trying to remind our audience, although they're melting down a lot about a lot of this stuff recently, especially with fair games and Concord, which we don't really know anything about is I'm like, you just have to understand what Sony is seeing. That like, they look at Genshin Impact and they're like, oh my God, like we are making so much money and we don't 30% rips on all these games. Why don't we get involved in this in some way and make 100%? Why can't we do that with the power of the PlayStation platform to proliferate it? That's why they got in on mobile, although the mobile initiative is clearly failing. They got rid of a bunch of people and all the rest. So. This is why I think Sony is in a bit of a vulnerable vulnerable position right now because the the economics are changing around them and the realities are changing around them and so I think that they're working. That's why the bungee the bungee purchase was so urgent and why they spent so much money on retaining the talent there. We always underline that on Sacred Symbols that like the part of the bungee purchase that was so interesting was that it was over a billion of dollars was only for retention. So, so like, which is crazy. So they need help. You know. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. I'm my sorry. question to you, Colin, real quick is. You know, I think we've talked about this briefly in the past, like on IOP, but you know how IOP is, especially when you're on, there's like 10 other people there. So, so it'd be better to get, you know, your perspective on this now where it's just us three. 
let's say that these live service games start doing very well. Let's say, you know, let, let's let's aim for the skies. Instead of getting maybe one or two hit, they hit like three or four. And one hits really good. Are you concerned that realistically you would expect some of that money to be funneled back into the brand to, you know, make more single player games, maybe make more live service games? Are you concerned that if they start seeing that really good money of live service games, they might start putting the the too much of their of their money into the live service a little bit away from the single player is that a concern for you any well um yeah i think it is a concern it's certainly a concern I, I, what i would imagine would happen let's say that they launch these 12 games whatever they are whatever nature they are and so let's say three of them hit which would be i think they would be thrilled as like a pig and shit if that happened then maybe what they would do is take that profit and just invest in second party games i mean that's always kind of been their style anyway. Some of their biggest games were second party games and even, you know, games like Killzone and um, Resistance and even the original Spider-Man. These were all made as second party games. People forget about that. So um, it would be interesting if they like invested there, you know, kept the money internal in terms of investing in, in maybe new studios. Haven becomes a big thing or Firewalk or whatever because of their games as a service. And then you invest in these six second party one off games that kind of retained the single player provenance of PlayStation that's important to the audience. Cause I think Sony would be crazy to not understand that that's an important part of the equation. And they also see that they make a lot of money on those games too. I mean, um, in some way it's much more risky with a much bigger upside for them to make a Fortnite clone than it is for them to make the last of us part three. The last of us part three is going to sell 15 million copies. You know, like they know that they're going to make $250 million or something and profit on it. That's like all safe and sound. They're ready to go, but they want big money. And that's that's simply not big money. And we see that now. So, yeah, it's a risk. And I think that that's what people are afraid of. And I keep saying on the show, too, that the reason you are you're not seeing fair games and 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 uh, Concord and stuff like that is not necessarily because they have nothing to show. It's because I don't think they're going to be you're going to be very happy when you see it, not from a gameplay perspective, but because it's going to be one of these games, I think. And PlayStation fans minds are kind of melting about that. And I understand it's a new generation of of type of PlayStation game that might redefine what it is to be a PlayStation game. But people have to remember that Sony does have a little bit of a provenance in some multiplayer games as well that mattered. And they have to rediscover that if they want to survive long term. I do think that it's it's smart for them to, to invest in it. I just hope that we can have both ways. And I think I think we can. Yeah. Um, next question is, this is probably a short sure response. I think we covered this is from Carlos Claudio. He says, Colin, going forward, what would be the best case scenario for gamers uh, going forward in terms of what direction Xbox goes, what more acquisitions, expanding current studios, et cetera? I don't think that this is well, this. So this is this kind of gets into what I was saying earlier, is that. Like the manufacture of games from like the embryonic state of an idea until like the disc enters your console or you download the package or whatever on PSN or Xbox or whatever. Um, this is a deeply economic situation that requires like great attention paid to how like the, the money's paid to make games, how games are purchased and from whom. Mm-hmm. And that's, I think the big thing that I want to underline and my, so like my big argument against what's going on right now, consolidation generally is that, you don't want companies that have so much money to own all the means that they can kind of redirect the economy in ways that affect their competitors and their ability to create games too, because this isn't like creating tchotchkes. It's not like creating gears and wheels and like cardboard boxes. It's video games and expectations are growing. Cost of making games is growing. And I thought it was really telling. And I, we underlined this on our show was that, we now have three of the four CEOs of the biggest mainstream AAA console games publishers in history on the record saying that they think Game Pass is a bad idea. Right? Like we heard Bobby Kodak himself say it on the stand. We've heard Jim Ryan say it in his deposition. And Strauss Zelnick has been going on about it for years now in their social in their in their earnings calls on Take Two. And I I pay attention to this because I think that they're kind of sounding a klaxon about um, how games are funded and how they might not be able to meet the expectations of players long term if players are not willing to spend money on video games. And so I don't I don't root for the consolidation of gaming because I think that it will admit in the mid and long term, 
maybe not in the short term because games take so long to make, but in the mid and long term, this will have a deleterious effect on on the quality of games we get, the variety of games we get, and more because everything will be funneled through a single subscription service with a single arbiter. Where on, I mean, will you guys agree that Xbox game sales are decaying? But I don't mean console sales. I mean sales like sales of software are decaying. Yeah. Do you guys agree? So I I yeah, would ag- real quick. I would agree, uh, but I do think that some of that is just people that were go that. There are a, a subside. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. There are a huge amount of people that used to take risks buying, especially like indie games. You know, they're like, "Oh, this game looks cool." But now I do feel like there's that Game Pass effect where they're like, "Oh, this game looks cool," but it looks like something that would come in Game Pass in a couple months. So I wait on that. I think for the most part, then people have checked out. Like they are not buying games anymore. They are waiting for those games unless they like them. Uh, but in terms of you know, certain like big triple H stuff that's not Xbox, like uh, even even companies that generally work with Microsoft, like like Sega, you know, the the new the new what what's the you, game? Yakuza like a uh, dragon. Like like a dragon. I think it's called wealth or something. That's coming out. There are gonna be some people that will not buy that because they're they're expecting it in Game Pass, but I do feel like what are those people gonna buy it anyway? That's debatable. I, I think for the most part, people going out and buying like a dragon day one without e- any hope of Game Pass, they were most likely going to buy that game regardless. I think what you're having is you having this middle section that used to take risks. They're not buying it anymore. And that's what you're seeing going because they didn't buy every game. They would buy some games in this vein, some games in this vein. But then when you get something like Game Pass and it's giving these people the illusion that any game, that's on Xbox can go in game pass at any time you would have a lot of people that would be more critique and they're like, okay, I don't have to vote with my wallet. I'll buy something that I know is not going to go in game pass stuff like big games, like, you know, uh, the, the Hogwarts game, GTA, Call of Duty's up till now, GTA. I feel like those games are doing still okay because the hardcore knows they ain't going in game pass. Yeah, the, the bigger games are actually doing better than ever. Yeah. And so it, it does reinforce what you were saying about this kind of middle ground, I think. Uh, see, it's it's what we say all the time, like, we, we, we're bringing up, or I bring up rational interest, right? The rational self-interest in the consumer is to get Game Pass. Game Pass is a great value for, like, what it is, like, for what it's promising. That you can get Starfield day and date on Game Pass for what is it, fifteen dollars a month or whatever, or not even? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think the dollar, the dollar menu's back. You get it for a dollar, right? Now. Yeah, and they're doing that by the way because they're probably worried about their monthly active users and they want to they want to get those numbers up. And I, I understand that. I don't blame them. Um, I, I thought it was weird when they got rid of it completely. I got Game Pass briefly last year and got it for a dollar, and then I was like, I went to cancel it just because I I didn't want it to renew, and they just gave me the dollar back. I was like, well, I didn't want the dollar back. It's like, it, um, but uh, because I was playing Halo Master Chief collection at the time for um another one of our shows and so i think that i want to underline this this notion because i think some people are confused about the way i feel about this is that like i think game pass from a consumer's point of view is great Mm -hmm. but i think that that's not always like the bottom line it how do you wedge it into there right like we have great deals with amazon today we all love amazon and it's really really convenient and i use amazon all the time but it has like it's had massive consequences yeah, on the economy yeah. like we can ignore it's that i guess but that's shut that's, down a lot of businesses yeah a lot. no absolutely yeah you, those are legit concerns but my thing is is that because uh, the whole thing about co- consolidation and i understand it's a reason to be concerned about consol- consolidation has been bad in many of the things we had it in our you know phones and services but i feel like gaming has gone through a cost consolidation before and it created a bunch of indies we had a lot more publishers than we had today we've had there was a point in time where we had several publishers putting out different football games. I had more options for football from, from like about four different publishers uh, for basketball, for baseball. And that all went away. Like uh, uh, with, I guess when we lost like midway, when we lost, um, oh man, who was the other, uh, uh, man, there was so many other publishers. I feel like we've gone through like a consolidation uh, sometime between like the, uh, PS2 360 generation. I feel like there was a lot more publishers and there there was a little a low then and indies came 
uh, to, I guess, to fill in those gaps, because I feel like there was also a gap in uh, uh, AAA releases. I feel like we used to have a lot more AAA releases previously, and it's crazy because gaming has grown more now than it was before, but the early days of gaming are released like that from like the early 2000s and stuff. I feel like there was a lot more games releasing, a lot more publishers out there, and a lot more uh, competition, um, but we but it survived. <laughs> Yeah, I, I well, I think that's solid. I think that's a totally solid way of looking at it, like solid analysis. I mean, this is where names like Square Enix, Tecmo, Koei, Bandai, Namco, these are all consolidated, consolidated companies. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. It, it's it's absolutely true. But and here's where the rubber meets the road for me. And this is the hard thing for like, I, it's not a hard thing for me to say because I don't care. But I think that people get offended on behalf of Xbox when I say this. But it's it's true. It's like, um, they're not Microsoft, like Tecmo and Koei are not Microsoft. They're creative companies. You know, Squaresoft was a creative company. Enix was a creative company. Microsoft's not a creative company. It's a behemoth of a tech company. And it's it's got a creative outlet to it. But even like that's why I was saying earlier, if you wanted to have something like a consolidative effort in games, you would want Nintendo to do it because they're the most creative company. You know, you wouldn't even want Sony to do it if you had your options. You'd want Nintendo to do it. That's my problem. And that's why I want to ask you guys and turn it around. Why should we be excited about like we, we it, it, there's so much propag frankly just propaganda. It's crazy. Like this is good for gamers like because because Phil Phil Spencer signed contracts with five companies that won't exist in 2 years to put their games on on these these cloud services. It's like, "Oh, very cool." You know? I've, um but in in re reality, it seems like it's a blatantly consolidative effort by a mega corporation that dwarfs basically any other entity in the entire games industry that has had 22 years to figure this thing out internally and organically. And then people like to point at Sony buying Psygnosis in 1993, which by the way, remained third party, much to the consternation of Sony. Sony tried to sell them because of that. And then they point to that and then Sony making a sequence of purchases with second parties ever since then, until very recently when the game was changed on them again. This is why I would love for you guys to explain to me why this is good that the company that has shown the least tact and and I guess skill in the games industry mm -hmm. with all of the means of Microsoft mm -hmm. at their disposal. I know it wasn't always actively there, but this is a company that tried to literally go and buy Nintendo, as we as we all know, right? I mean, yeah. Um, so I feel like why would we ever root for the com a company like Microsoft it's to be a, doing something like this? It, it's not like they're, it, it, it's it's not like they're at the top of their game and they're bringing all of these things, and it's actually that they're losing compared to their competition and then they're consolidating around them and that that warps the creative economics of the industry towards the loser and i'm sorry so, but that's just i don't mean that as an, um, an insult to the brand i'm saying it relative i'm happy they're, they're still doing great but anyway I, that's why i wanted no to no i'm happy you asked because that's, the, that's one of the reasons uh i i wanted you on this podcast because you had you said something like this in a clip of sacred symbols that you posted on Twitter, which was, I think maybe from last week or two weeks ago's episode, I have it on my Twitter page. I might even have it like pinned to a degree, but uh, cause I wanted to address, <laughs> address that. But I, I know you want something to say before I go, I'm just holding the thought in my head. I, th I think for me, I would say don't, you know, don't think any company is the end all be all to just cure everything. I will say is do my, it's like my issue. I think the biggest issue that, Microsoft has is the check and balances. You know, they leave the studios or to, to fend for themselves to a degree, you know, uh, if they do the hands off thing. You know, some studios do well. Uh, they have been very vocal that Psychonauts is a better game because of Microsoft. Wasteland's a better game because of Microsoft. You could clearly see that they put a lot of effort behind Starfield. We'll have to see how that goes. I'm completely there with you, Colin. Like for every game I just show you, I can you can probably name three or four adjacent ones that has ruined the studio. Uh, you know, Rare to some degree. You know, sure we might not like Rare, where Rare has been. I don't know how you feel about Sea of Thieves, Colin, but I'm sure there's a lot of people. People that, love that game. I think that you, Rare, if anything, has like had a second life in some sense now. Yeah, it, I think I'm at that point where it's like going back to the the other questions. Like has has Phil redeemed himself for the, the earlier part of his career as being head of Xbox to now? I'll say, look, there was a lot of issues wrong with the Xbox brand. I will say he fixed a lot of the issues, but not the biggest issue, which was games. And until he starts delivering those games, 
And until they start seeing the light, we have to see how Starfield is. We have to see how Hellblade is. Until you start seeing these studios turning around with the help from Microsoft, the funding from Microsoft, the talent from Microsoft, and start seeing those solid games, those really good games, those quote unquote bangers, I would recommend. It's like if you feel away about Microsoft and you want to step back and see what they're doing before you step forward, takes two steps back. That's that's perfectly understandable to me because. Microsoft has showed through a variety of different ways, through Redfall, through State of KB and as buggy as it was, through a multiple of games that until they show you the quality, until they show you that they have learned from their mistakes, I don't blame people for being skeptical going into the, to the whole situation. Um, I'm going to answer the question why. I, I guess I, I'm not a fan of the the question. Um oh. We're X. I'm an Xbox fan. You know what I mean. So to to some degree, there's only so much they can really do wrong. I'm going to root for every purchase they make because and <laughs> and, and, and no no I'm just being real. Like and people don't want to admit it, but as an Xbox fan, right? Them buying things, I'm looking at it from a selfish perspective. How who who they buy will have to benefit me some way now. Again, we know Microsoft no longer does like this, uh, you no, know, the Xbox exclusive, but it's at this point, I've been converted to a subscription gamer, right? So it's like, okay, I want this stuff to go into Game Pass. Like Activision Blizzard, there's a, there's a fair amount of games from Activision that I haven't touched, you know, prototype one and two. Yeah, I'm guilty. I haven't played them. Kind of interested. You're not missing anything, man. Those, those games. I, I, I've seen people talking about that. Like, bring back prototypes. I'm like, dude, prototypes sucks. I don't, know, I don't know, like, what you're talking about. But I, I wrote the strategy guide for the first game, actually, and uh, I platinum the second one. And those games suck. So anyway, go ahead. so but the thing is, is that rooting. It's it's hard to say. Like, why do you? root for them because that's the thing when i'm me rooting for xbox i'm not rooting for gaming i'm not rooting for playstation or the industry as a whole is, i'm is rooting like i i'm not a football fan let me interrupt you real mm-hmm. is it the cool to the football stuff where you pick one team and you root for that bastard no matter what the hell they do because i'm not a football no fanatic no or anything it, like it, that. Y- yes and no because colin also you made a, a analysis and you use i think the tampa bay rays or something like that how they mm-hmm. draft like you know they do everything through like they spend less money they do everything through the draft they develop players and stuff like that but i'm a fan of uh, uh you know uh, for football i'm a fan of the patriots but uh, other sports i'm oh a fan God, of the, really yes oh, that's brutal <laughs> yeah, <man>. yeah. <laughs> but for example i love the lakers i love lebron james i uh, for other teams they and what do they do the lakers they they buy players. The Yankees, they buy players. They, they've they had success. Sure, we all like the little story. We like the go to state Warriors story. We like the Tampa Bay race stories when they do occur. But those generally aren't the norm. Most people sp- uh, spend money and they do that to win. So, yeah, it's some people like the, or- the organic way. But the way I look at it, it's like, OK, PlayStation obviously is dominant. I'm not, I've been conceded like PlayStation. Yes, they are the best at what they do. Nintendo is the best at what they do. Xbox, the only way Xbox can compete, I'm not a fan of Xbox building studios and taking 10 years uh, for that studio to get uh, cohesion and and uh, chemistry. And then they finally put out a couple games in their third games, a freaking mega hit. No, that's not that time. 15 years have passed. I I'm li- we're all on like short time. So <laughs> I need so Microsoft, the only way they really can't compete, really, they have to use their assets and what they do best. They make money. Their biggest weapon is money. Buy your way, buy your way to releases. Xbox lap games. I wanted them to buy games. Buy buy something to, to fill out the uh your your releases that when they acquire Zenimax, I'm like, dude, you're rich. Cancel those agreements with Ghostwire and Deathloop. Yeah, they weren't the greatest games to ever release, but I had to show something that you got something to release. I mean, Redfall literally had to release because at the end of the day, this is how we look at this, right? The state that Microsoft was in and the way that we perceive Microsoft, they mismanagement, they always canceling games and all this other stuff. Imagine this. Imagine this. They acquire Zenimax, right? And the first thing they announce or that we get revealed is Redfall is canceled. You think we would be like, yeah, they know what they're doing. No, we'd be like, what the hell they're doing? It'll be another scale bound moment. 
but it was damn if they do. Damn if you cancel it, right? Because now that's one less game you got to release. And at this point, the Red Fall at this time was the well, no hi fi rush, but at that time, going into it, Red Fall was like the first exclusive um, that came out since the acquisition. And it's been what two years now. And so they, it was damn if they did release it. They released it and it was damn. And it would have been damn if they canceled it because of the, the optics. Look at what happened with Scalebound, Fable Legends, anything, uh, uh, anything that they like announced in Phantom Dust, whatever, anything that they have announced that they did not release, they've got heavy backlash. And them acquiring uh, Zenimax and them having uh, this um, reputation of being like uh, bad with studio management, bad for studios, uncreative and stuff like that. And the first thing they do after their biggest acquisition at the time for uh, gaming. Um, was to cancel one of their uh, one of their original IPs. It would have been catastrophic uh, for it in the terms of public opinion. Um, so yeah, they argued this uh, this ABK deal about like yeah we're we we have no presence in mobile gaming. We can't do it you no know, naturally. We have to buy at least a position in it to grow. Like we can't compete with Sony to the degree because they have so many more exclusive. We have to buy into it. And, and you question why do we root uh for them because they essentially suck at what they do just everybody has their uh, their fan base uh there's something good that someone does i'm pretty sure somebody back in 1995 felt the same way about uh you know playstation trying to hold on to their sega saturn and whatever the dreamcast was going to bring to before playstation came and demolished whatever they did it turned sega into a complete third party but um there's no real I guess answer to say why would you want to root because you're asking realistically you're asking a bunch of fanboys and you're not going to get the you're not going to get a real answer and the thing is is and when it comes to it it's like all right playstation has been dominating we know playstation is great we want xbox to be great and if the, if they're going to be great by buying you know major tr players such as you know call of duty and and sega well i'll be it and we're going to ride for it that's so that's my that's what i want them to do whether at the end of the day if um whether they succeed I, I mean i sure hope they succeed with it at this very moment in time i want xbox to be successful i want game pass to be successful in hopes that that it's reinvested into me as a gamer whether they they're buying things or creating things i i need it to be successful in ways that mixer wasn't <laughs> yeah i um I mean, that makes sense. It almost sounds to me like our arguments actually kind of live in harmony with each other and simply in that we're arguing about two different things. Like, because I don't think anything you're saying is wrong or incorrect because these are personal feelings that I would understand. I think that the 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 allusion to sports makes some sense. I'm a diehard Islanders and Jets fan. And, um, you know, I it's hard for me to relate to that level of fanboy fandom because half of my time my entire life as a Jets fan has been hating the Jets, you know, like, like <laughs> reading, reading all, you know, gangrene nation every day and reading the comments and everyone just commiserating. And like right now it's an unusually happy time to be a Jets fan, like almost historically happy time. And that's what we're kind of used to. And so part of, for me, part of what I'm old enough to, uh, how old are you guys? I don't even know how old you are. Actually, I'm 34. Oh, okay. So you guys are close in age to me. I'm, I'm, I'm 38 and, uh, not too close. You're not that old, but, I grew up in the era of the NES, 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 and my my older brother, who's a big part of our show, uh, one of our shows, um, and our relationship and playing games together was a big part of that. And I was a major hardcore Nintendo fanboy. Um, when PS1 came out, I loved it because I love Japanese role playing games and I played my PS1 and I had a ton of PS1 games um, and right on through to PS2 and, and, and so on and so forth. But I actually really, really, really loved Nintendo. And during the Wii era, I love GameCube and N64 and all the rest. And during during uh, w the early Wii era, I was like, this kind of fucking sucks. Yeah, yeah, I walked away from Nintendo during the Wii yeah. era. Yeah. And and that to me is like holding. I was the same. And 3DS was kind of like the last nail in the coffin because I love GBA and DS, obviously Game Boy and Game Boy Pocket and all that. Um, so I don't want to make it sound like I wasn't playing PlayStation at the beginning and that I wasn't interested because I was. I loved PlayStation, but I really was at heart a Nintendo fan, like through and through. And they just lost me because it wasn't working out. So I'm always open to um, reassessing my relationship as a consumer and as a fan of different products, not 
my sports fandom because I think that that's I'm, I'm from Long Island and that's allied to where we're from. We're Jets fans, we're Islanders fans. That's what I'm always going to be. But on a consumer, on a market, I do pick and choose. Like PlayStation couldn't kick me in the gut over and over again as a player. And then I'm going to be like, this is fucking great. <laughs> and um, I'm not saying that that's what's happened to Xbox fans. That's why I really thought it was important when I was saying like they're losing. It's relative, right? Xbox is selling, you know, well, it's doing fine. Game Pass is, I think, probably static in numbers, but has a sizable foundation of people that want to games as a, as, a subscript, uh, as a subscription. What I simply lament, and this is why I think our arguments can live side by side because they're arguing two different things, is that what you are so excited about and your fandom and whatever, it unfortunately doesn't stop at the walls of the Xbox ecosystem. What what Microsoft is doing here is going to affect all of us. And that is a problem for me, you know, like not from a legal standpoint, which I wouldn't make the legal argument simply because my whole argument here is Microsoft act like Activision. Like, why do you care about this when you haven't cared about all these other things? You should care about that, but you didn't care about all these other mergers. So it would be kind of unfair to go after Microsoft. That's always been my argument there. But my creative arguments are I, I stand by because I think that. That's why I lament it happening at the bottom and how that affects things. It's the same thing what happened with iPhone in the race to the bottom and zero dollar games. I mean, microtransactions, games as a service. I mean, if you're not talking about MMOs and stuff, but games as a service and all these things, they come from mobile gaming. Okay. You know, like, okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and and so so to me, the other parallel that I think is important to bring up is actually very timely in what is going on with the streaming services in TV and in movies. They're in they're fucked right now. Like, yeah, they, yeah, they have a big problem because there's three things. And, and it's actually the, it's something that Microsoft has started to do since the Xbox One generation. And I don't blame them. Companies hide their numbers when they don't want to talk about them. And I'm not making fun of them for that. But they don't talk about specific numbers because they don't want you to know. And this is what is this is what's happening with Netflix and others where no one knows how many people watch these shows. Like no one actually knows what the buy in the economics of the entire situation could be totally backwards. And what we what we're learning from um, what we're learning from this the sag after strike and the writer strike is that residual checks are really poor that people even in these unionized very professional places are and in these um in these industries are uh they're they're not well taken care of by the creative aspect like the, the creators and the i mean there's sorry, a strike right going, now going, going on yeah sorry you guys are moving around i just didn't know it was something you no, guys, no, 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 no. We're, we're good. We're good. My back uh, is fine. It's fine. But I got you. I just didn't know if I was I was missing something. <laughs> no. Um, so I just feel like when you look just to, re to restart that one sentence, when you have like a, the SAG after and all these really established entertainment um, silos of of actors and creative peoples and all the rest in these purportedly very successful streaming services saying that their residual checks amount to hundreds of dollars a year for some of these shows that the shows are disappeared for tax write downs and so that residuals don't have to be paid and all of that and then we segue that mentality to the video game industry where the where the the people that make games are way le treated way worse than that i also think that there's this bubbling problem of um of labor which is why i think it's so interesting that microsoft is willing to take on a fairly fervently pro union e uh development group in activision and how that might affect the, cre uh, the, the which I think is good. I think these people need to be taken care of. But the, the reality I'm saying is, is that subscriptions aren't working for movies and TV at all. It's convenient for us as consumers. Yeah, I agree. The, I love it. I think it's it's doing great. But what have we got? Have we really gotten better quality stuff? I mean, I'm pretty sure that people still point to shows like The Sopranos and The Wire and Mad Men and all these things that have nothing to do with streaming mm -hmm. as amongst the best shows of all time. And I'm not saying that, th that great things don't come from streaming, too. Of course they do. And I have. I usually rotate between the streaming services, so I only have one at a time. Yeah. Uh, and right now I have Netflix. And so I enjoy that stuff, too. But we have to ask ourselves, like, do we care about the art and do we care about the artist? Do we care about the quality of the art? Do we care about who we pay for it and how we, we get in all that? And I say yes. The answer is yes. Mm. And so, I've shown that flexibility in the past as a fan of Nintendo. That's why I bring that up is to say, like, at some point they did lose me like that were, where they weren't serving me anymore. And so I'm not married to anything at all. What I said earlier about being a single player gamer, there's no better place to be than where I am right now. You know, so, like, and that's that's why I want to. So it's I'm sorry. I just want to finish this. I it's it's self. And this is what we were saying on the show. I was saying with Jaffe when I had David Jaffe on is like my my point of view is inherently selfish. Yeah, I don't I, I don't 
pretend otherwise. I'm not making a legal argument or anything like that. I'm simply saying like this has a butterfly effect that's going to that's going to that reverberate far beyond the walls of the Game Pass ecosystem. And I don't like the ramifications of that. I don't think the ramifications are good. And I don't think the economics actually work when a company like Microsoft isn't behind it. Game Pass wouldn't be a thing if Microsoft wasn't doing it. Anyway, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So just to clarify, you're concerned with the way Game Pass is structured. It slowly hits down on the quality of games. And then, I mean, you are right because to a degree, you know, you are seeing uh, people adapt the Game Pass model. You're seeing even PlayStation is like completely restructured how their entire PlayStation Plus is because of Game Pass. So I, I would agree with you on that. I, I do think there are concerns that I personally have that because it makes a lot less sense to have a whole lot of money go into a game when you can just have less money go to a game and have like an okay product than a, like a, a superior product go into Game Pass. I, I think that we have to see how the structure of Bethesda, Blizzard, Activision, and King go and to see if those games start being built differently, like clearly you know you start seeing like way less quality games go into the matter you know i i do have a lot of the same concerns that you have with the industry in terms of game pass effect i i will say that as long as game pass functions the way it was originally described where they can take more risks i'm okay with the game pass model but as long as that continues to happen you know i'd like to see a banjo kazooie i like to see a conquer i like to see all these you know, not to mention the the hundred properties that Activision, Blizzard, and King have, and without something like Game Pass, you probably never would have took the risks. But I have to see more of those risks being handled, and not necessarily, you know, Halo Infinite. You can argue that that could have easily have been just a standard single player with a with a the the way that their Halo multiplayer constantly functions, and it would have been better. We don't know if that was done because of competition, because of Fortnite, mm -hmm. because of battle passes, mm -hmm. or was it done to be put into Game Pass because of microtransactions? Mm, no. Um, I'm going to say a couple of things. Like, Colin's uh, beef, I mean, if I'm probably poor, uh, poorly uh, making this assumption, your beef is how media entertainment is consumed generally. It all started with music, right? You know, mm -hmm. when the music industry had, had to suffer, we went from CDs to downloads at High Napster and, um, and uh, then it went to the, you know, the streaming thing where they had to, I mean, I don't know, do they even certify albums platinum anymore? Like how many streams you have to get? <laughs> like, a, Yeah, I don't know. I, they, sh they share the numbers, but I don't, I don't know how like the RIA or whatever yeah. Like, yeah, do, does that anymore. I, I, I agree with you. And by the way, like I think. <laughs> Music streaming is awesome, and I think that TV and movie streaming fundamentally is yeah. awesome, too. We just can't pretend yeah. that it didn't mess everything up. And by the way, music is probably the least affected because the vet, the, the money-making avenues were always touring and merch anyway. Yeah. That, oh, problem, yeah, you're right. Yeah. The problem with games is, and that's why like I people are like, oh, you like Spotify? And I'm like, yeah, dude, like, who cares? I go, I go see the bands I like, and they make money off of me, like way more money than if I was going to go buy a record from them. I mean, that that's that's always been true. So... Uh, I don't feel so bad about that. And TV and movies, like it seemed like a good idea, but I can't pretend that it is now that we're seeing this, like the, a complete meltdown where people are saying like, there might not be any new TV produced this year, you know? Yeah, um, it's, it's bad. It's, it's really like, bad. like, because people, because actors are saying, and I think others are saying too, and mm -hmm. it's not just actors, it's all the people in behind the scenes as well. It's just that their, their contracts aren't necessarily up. Although I think the Teamsters contract is up soon and all of the rest and this can get really, really messy is they're saying like this, structure of doing business is actually not working like you're saying it is because at the bottom end like the people that make your stuff are saying that like we can barely pay our bills and so something's obviously broken while you're showing profit in quotes i'm getting 200 dollars a year for my scripts that i put on netflix when in when during tv syndication i would have been paid thousands of dollars and everyone seemed like that was fair and so i look at that experience and i say like well it's an echo of what might be to come and that's why i was saying in this industry where we haven't even begun this industry is so young it's not mature yet where we haven't even begun to deal with the, the true problems of labor so we are like way behind so you feel like we might the whole industry might collapse on itself from well, like it's residuals just like, and stuff right like like the reality is, is if you make a game and it's on game pass and just in perpetuity available as a commercial product right so 
you don't have like your your game published and printed on PS4 and then it kind of comes and goes and it's available in a back catalog and maybe it's on PS Plus or whatever. You're like perpetually putting this thing up up front. There's no way for you to get your residuals or anything like that, which I think would be I owed actually, in the same way that would be. Yeah. I actually have an example that would go with your scenario. It's the same thing that with Square Enix, Game Pass, and people can fly with Outriders. Uh, they didn't meet their their demands in terms of how many how much the game would sold so they never had to pay the residuals or anything and, and they they took the game and didn't even tell people could fly put it on game pass right and by the way like they i, I by the way i think outriders is awesome that was like one of my favorite games that year but yep. generally speaking people generally people speaking uh speaking people didn't like it it was more of like what they would call a game a game pass game i think exo primal is the most recent example of that but that's fine. I mean, there's a market for that. I like those. I like <clears throat> dumb a games too. Um, but I just think that there's, there's, there's so many pro it's just so weird to hear the, the drum beating rooting for like a massive mega corporation, one of the biggest corporations in the human history, acquiring the biggest publisher in the industry. And everyone's like, yeah. And, and everyone's like making fun of the government for trying to say like, I don't know about this. And, and it's like, what like what what kind of backwards universe do we live in where that that's like good and i i think that people need to divorce themselves from like rooting for their team to realize the greater economics which is why i've always argued like you brought the yankees it's interesting i grew up a yankees fan i stopped rooting for the yankees you know 15 probably more than years ago than that because i found the mlb to be increasingly boring as teams spent both 20 million or 30 million on their rosters i remember when a rod got signed and he was making more money than specific rosters and the MLB, I'm like, this is broken. The economics are broken. It's fine that you want winners and it's exciting, but I think it's not fun anymore. And so there's that aspect to it as well. But I really think that the creation of games needs to be economically rewarded. You want to you want to reward the highest talent. And if Game Pass was truly compelling, you would get big games on it from third parties that would be willing to sell the games to Microsoft. But that does not happen. And that's why that's why when I think when people are like, oh, so much Strauss Zelnick says that Game Pass is 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 value destructive. This random CEO from a publisher whose entire hit, whose entire future is riding on this one game put their game on Game Pass. He loves it. It's like, yeah, I, I would imagine so, dude. Like, I own, I I I, I co own a developer. We have we're working on our sixth and seventh games now. We we've sold our games to Microsoft for games for gold with gold or whatever. Like, I know how it goes, and. Like when you are trying to get to your next game and you don't give a shit about anything else, but just getting to your next game and the economics of that game and whatever, I would hedge my bets in any way possible. We tried to sell our last game or we tried to put our last game on Game Pass. They denied it. And I don't really blame them. And I don't think it's something they were really looking for. We make like 8-bit and 16-bit side-scrolling games. But we are curious about how it works for young indie developers because we don't have the luxury of caring about how it affects the greater ramif the ramifications of the greater industry because we just want to survive. Yeah. And so when you see that kind of stuff from a CEO, that's like, we love it. It's like, yeah, I'm sure you do, man. Like it's, and I would love it too. But the guys who make games like real games, like the triple a big money games are saying like this, this can't work. Like we can't make the economics of these games work. And that's why I think that PS plus and game pass. And I think Nintendo's online service is awesome too. For back catalog games is dope. I think that's a great idea. Even as soon as like six months or a year, I think that that's totally Dude. fine. I'm simply arguing for like day and date sales of games. And so, I well, yeah. real quick, real quick, Smith. Let's say Colin Starfield comes out. It's good. They start making very quality games. Fable's good. Perfect Dart's good. Avowed's good. But then once they get enough of these quality games out and they show a pattern, they come out there and they announce. No more day and date games in Game Pass. What would, 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 how would you feel about that? And I, do you do think that. they could can't survive that? They can't do that. There's no way they, no. I've said that before. Like that would be the end. Yeah. Uh, uh, I actually the, don't, of, of the brand, I, I, I think, I think they would take a massive hit for a while, but I think gamers, as long as the consistency of the quality continued, people would just shut up. No, think, at the end of the day, people go where the games are. And as much as they would disagree with the decision, if the games are good enough, people would just shut up and start buying them. Um, I, I think they can't do that. If the games are bad before uh, by any means, I think they cannot I think, do that. If I bad. actually added a question like last week and maybe, cause I, I still think it would be out of question if they ever like reverse the course of no, like I'm the not day saying and day. they don't get a huge massive PR hit. No, I'm saying that sooner or later, as long as the quality and the games are still good, continuing from that point on, 
you would start to see people just shut the hell up and buy the game. I think they would be better, like, because I know the whole question about day and date comes in and it cannibal cannibalize themselves. My thing is, would they get in much trouble if they did that day and date thing for a limited time, like maybe 30 days, 60 days after that, take it off, see what happens and then bring it back. Like, you know, as the hype we're down, like six months later, is it like, do you put the incentive by put, I guess, the sense of urgency, knowing that is going to leave and they put like a, a Nintendo, right? Well, Nintendo did to a, a worse degree, but, um, you know, instead of it being like, you know, it's permanent, like, hey, it's day and date, you know, until this date. So if you don't play it by this date, you know, you have to buy it. Is that a better way of going about day and date on your major triple a games i feel like oh i'm sorry god god i was just saying i don't know if that would accomplish anything because most sales come from that initial early on then the later part continue call yeah no i was just gonna say i think that i think that like the hypotheticals are interesting but microsoft is absolutely 100 percent sealed oh yeah yeah yeah. like there's no way out of it and i think that if they ever tried to pull that shit that it would be the beginning of the end for them because (laughs) i think that like they've they've not only painted themselves into this corner of having to defend this through basically all economic analysis. Otherwise, I mean, I was interesting to hear Jim Ryan, for instance, under oath in his in his deposition, saying as far as he understood it, that they were losing a lot of money on Game Pass. That's what I've been saying as well, even though they they do this this voodoo magic, you know, behind the scenes to make it seem like it's working. But that was what he was saying. That's why when people like Bobby Kotick were saying it's value destructive is what they're saying is that you have to take the money from over here to make this work. And that's why I was saying earlier that Microsoft makes Game Pass work with other money. And that's why it, it upsets the economics of, I don't know if I underline that enough for people, and maybe they don't understand that, is like when you have the economics of the industry being upset by a, a service like this, it ma- it just it resonates out from there. So I just I just want to underline that I think that there's just no way out. And they that's why I was asking you earlier if you agreed with what I think is an obvious observation that there is a massive decay in a la carte sales and xbox's ecosystem that's why i always think yeah, that there is that's why and so like you can't go back now like now you're gonna be like oh except for this game you have to buy people are gonna flip out you know so um so they have to make this work and how much it's gonna cost them and how much money you know so how they're gonna take money from peter to pay paul i have no idea but i thought it was really interesting to hear on the record these guys saying like yeah this is value destructive if, if i were people I, I i people thought it was funny that and I was reading that Bobby Codex, um, it was obviously honest, he's under under oath, but his his commentary during the the trial was so bad towards Game Pass that it looked like he was sabotaging the deal from the stand, like about what he was saying that like they would he's like, they we would never do that. We would never do that. You know, that kind of stuff. And then they asked him something like, why are you selling your company to them then? You know? Yeah. And I thought that that was like a really interesting interchange. So I just think that like. And that's why I was saying earlier. So developers like me that that make little indie games that sell 10,000 copies if we're lucky, right? Like if someone comes to us and says like we'll give you $50,000. It's like, yeah, fuck, okay. Like we can make we can make our next game. Like we'll put the that's great. But the guys that don't have to worry about the immediate economics but see the long tail don't see the long tail. And that to me is much more telling than lies of P going on Game Pass. Like of course they're going to hedge their bet and take that money. Why wouldn't they do that? You know, like who's losing in that in that scenario? The gamers aren't losing, which is great. The publisher and developers aren't losing, but that money is coming from somewhere and it's not coming from the space. And I think that's what Jim Ryan was kind of trying to get at with like his little snide comment, frankly, about yeah, it. And, you know, and I actually think that there's a another negative thing that's going on with Game Pass that a lot of people don't like talking about. I think that's the reason you see a lot of these like Japanese and some of these smaller titles miss Xbox entirely is because they're. <laughs> They're trying to get that Game Pass bag and, you know, they get the backlash and they're like, well, we'll just release it six months later because they're not going to pay us what we would think that game would require to be day one in Game Pass. But if we withhold it for the console, we could get that money later by releasing it day one in the Game Pass after we've got the initial sales from the other platforms. Because we've seen that happen a couple of times. (laughs) But can I tell you something else that I think is important to say about some of these Japanese games? Because I think there's some... I thought it was really disingenuous when mm-hmm. it, Sony when it was presented like this is how many exclusive games PS4 and PS5 have. This is how many exclusive games Xbox One and Xbox Series X have. And what? I wanted to really look at that list and carefully. And I'd be like, I would bet you half of those games are Japanese games that simply would never publish on Xbox anyway. 
Like and and it's and you're making and it's being positioned as if Sony was paying some sort of exclusive right to this. My theory about why some, especially some Japanese published games, don't come over is because they don't care about selling five thousand copies of their game, and they don't want to. They don't want to go through the ESRB rating, and they don't want to have producers doing all this shit and a little team working on porting it. And then when you patch it, you know you have to patch it here, and it has to be you know all taken care of, and it's broken, so now you have to fix it here, even though no one's playing. I don't think people look at it through that that lens, which is why I was asking again about the decaying nature of a la carte sales on Xbox. That is a reason why. You know, sometimes Sony goes and says, yeah, we will pay you like with Final Fantasy 16. But many of these games are simply they look at it and say, like, we're not going to sell any copies of this game there. Like, who cares? Like we we're Square Enix. We don't care about selling 10,000 copies. While to a company like us selling 10,000 copies is a massive success. That's why I think that like balancing the economics in a certain way that takes all of that into account is best for all players. And that the last time that the economies were so severely interfered with, it brought us things that we all hate that we deal with now in our space that came from a different space. And that's simply undeniable. So, mobile gaming. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, so to, to me, I, again, I want to reiterate game pass. Great deal. I mean, if I, you know, if I were a subscription, person, we have an Xbox, my, my fiance is an Xbox gamer, but she doesn't use it. She likes to buy her games. But if I were a subscription person, I'd be all over that. You know, I totally understand it. I understand Microsoft's motivation behind it. I understand Activision's motivation in selling. I, I get all of it. I'm simply making the argument from an artistic and creative point of view Talk about, about the health, keeping the health of the, the health. industry. Right. Exactly. Like that's and that like if you wanted something so disruptive to happen, it's probably the worst possible company to be doing it. And, I'm, and I don't say that as an insult to Xbox. It's just it's just out of the three major players. The other two have don't have found much more success in gaming. And you would want them to be the ones that tipped the Apple card over, not the company that's kind of losing to them and therefore must tip the apple card over because that benefits them in the short term and probably none of us in the long term and that's uh, that's my argument so that's simply my i understand people are mad about that and i get that but that's that's my philosophical argument and you have to understand it's not an economic argument per se it's it, although i'm arguing that games are i'm not making a let's say i'm not making a legalistic argument because i'm not i don't give a shit if they buy them or not from that point of view i really don't yeah. you know <laughs> I, I think that you could make an argument that they were going to go this direction regardless because the rest of their whole company started to go in subscription services. They even put Microsoft Word on subscription services. And, and I, I, I want to point out, like, even though that I disagree with you, Colin, on certain aspects of the industry, I do respect the fact that you have so much knowledge and maybe because there's always a middle ground. And, and I feel like for the most part, most people come to the middle ground. Just no one's willing to have the conversation to come to the middle ground. Well, no, I, I appreciate the, the kind words. I, to me, I, I that's why I, I try to see like the other the other side's perspective on any of my arguments. And here, it's not hard to see the other side's perspective. It's simply not from it's a self interested point of view, you know. Um, and so my argument is equally self interested, but it's self interested as a player of games. And I'm just trying to pay attention to the signs around us and seeing how that may or may not resonate yeah uh with our with uh with our industry i don't know yeah i mean there's a there's a lot of things you know you mentioned that i'm i you know i i'm afraid of a little bit um of the industry you know certain changes and stuff like that um at one day I, I mean once before i thought you know consoles were gonna you know go and you know that's when everybody you know like pretty much bought into this whole loot crate system this free-to-play system games as a service believe it or not like um uh, I hate I'm more scared of games, games as a service. I hate, now, this is going to sound bad. I like Game Pass, but I hate the games as a service like multiplayer. Like Me too. when I was going into Halo, right? Turn everything into a TV show. That's literally what they've done. Halo, like Halo Infinite for me, like the thing is the way I played Halo, it was different. Like I, I play my campaign and then when I'm done with the campaign, I do multiplayer. And I only play Halo really to just play my matches, get, see where I'm at on the leaderboards, check my KD. Boom. I'm not a season pass gamer. I am not. A, I can't follow seasons. I'm not a battle pass gamer. And every multiplayer game that really seems to exist today is a battle passes. I can't get with it. I just like to just play. I don't want to have to keep up with anything. I don't want to have to make sure I hit all these objectives. And that's where Halo lost me. It's like, dude, I, I can't play Halo. Like a lot of people were complaining about Halo. Like, oh, none of content. They're not keeping up with the battle pass. It's like, uh, I don't really care. I don't even play. Like, I don't care how long they take on a battle pass. 
I just, I'm just playing Halo. I'm playing Halo Infinite like I played Halo, Halo 3. Yeah, minus a lot of content, but the way I'm playing Halo Infinite, I'm not waiting for the next season. I, I just, I can't get with it. But the thing is every, I don't like that the industry in all the multiplayer games has pivoted to that way because I can't just sit there and enjoy the game or just play whatever I want to play for that moment because everything is like, get this, get this, get this closed off or get this, get this before this ends or I got to play within this period to earn this. And it's like, I, what happens to the sometimes standard you ranking do a system? Pass. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes you got to do a battle pass and a season pass and a holiday thing where you're doing all of them at the same yeah. time. Yeah, I hear you. Let, let, let's because I, I do got to get going here soon. Yeah, uh, smooth. So let, let's just get BG's question and, and wrap this up. Yeah. So BG says a lot of people feel like PlayStation has to buy a publisher like Square Enix now as a reaction to Microsoft acquiring Activision and Bethesda. But I disagree. I don't know exactly what the best options are, but I believe there are other courses of actions to take without furthering the publisher arms race. Personally, I'm OK with developers being acquired, just not publishers. I think that was to you, Colin. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I do think that the buying of publishers is a little excessive. Mm -hmm. um, this is, again, what I was talking about when people were like, well, Sony bought Cygnosis and I'm like, oh my God. Cygnosis made lemmings in Shadow of the Beast. Are you kidding me? Like they just Microsoft just bought the, the the publisher that makes Call of Duty and Crash Bandicoot and Spyro and Diablo and Warcraft and Starcraft and all these games. It's nuts. And and they just a couple of years ago bought the publisher of Fallout and the Elder Scrolls and Doom and all these things. And I do think it's a little gratuitous from that point of view. I agree. That's why I was asking. I, I was wondering earlier when we talked about it. I'm like, do you think that Microsoft could potentially push it too far where like it starts to backfire on them? And I think that I think that at some point it, it does come off as optically gratuitous as well. Sony. So there are three different things, I guess. There's a, the way Sony should go, in my opinion, from a creative standpoint. And then there's probably the way they should go economically. And then there's the way that they're what they're going to do. And I think that those are three different things, like from a creative point of view. It's what I said earlier is like I made the case on Sacred Symbols that Sony could potentially get eight like so between first, second and third party multiplayer and single player, you get eight different uh, games going five single player from first, second in time, third party, and then maybe three games as a service flowing in and out as they make sense. And you could kind of sustain your console, I think, with that with a developing with a development pool of maybe 20 to 25 internal teams and then obviously an ex, a, a small constellation of second party partners and contract studios and that that's all they really need to do to keep the creative vision of PlayStation intact which I think has been really beneficial to them they're known for high quality games like I've said before that they're like kind of the HBO they're considered like the HBO of gaming like their games are events like that like when a when I when a season of House of or I'm sorry a Succession came out or when a season of uh House of the Dragon or whatever came out so I think that that's like what would be ideal is just find second party partners there's almost people ask like who should they buy and I'm like there's no one really left that makes sense. There's maybe Ballistic Moon would make sense because they're making a game for them, that that game Project Bates, which no one really knows anything about. But a lot of the studios that would even make sense, like Deviation, Deviation is failing. Sony pulled their money from them, right? So they're not an option. Um, Firewalk has been purchased. Haven has been purchased. Quantic Dreams moved on. You know, Level 5's moved on. From Soft, Sony owns a piece of, but they're never going to get them fully, I don't think. So there's there's like no natural partners for them. And so from a creative standpoint, that first thing I wanted to say is like, I think they just need to keep it kind of simple, control what they can control. There was something really interesting in the FTC write up about um, in the in the documents leading up to the FTC case where in the discovery where Microsoft said something about to the likes of, you know, they did oppo research basically on The Last of Us Part Two, and they wrote up this thing for marketing and they were basically saying, like, we don't even have anything in development approaching the quality of this. And they said this, I think, in 2020, 2021. And that's Sony's only advantage because they're never going to have a market advantage they're never going to have a money advantage and all that. So they need to protect the quality advantage, but they're not going to do that. I don't think the second thing is, is that the second way they can go forward, I think from an economic point of view is to like go totally crazy. And you could see a thing like this happening. I think people, again, really underestimate Sony's buying power through leveraging their brands and like what they own and all of that. They're not limited by cash on hand at all. 
But because the economy has such high interest rates, I think this precludes them from acting in a rash manner. Otherwise, and I think that's actually good for them. Otherwise, I think you could see them going after a, a big publisher that would you would think would be well beyond their bounds. You know, like an EA style acquisition where it would be like a true merger of two companies of, you know, more similar size than a Microsoft and an Activision, for instance. But the thing that I think they'll end up doing is that, uh, and this is the third thing, so the third option, is that I think they'll probably make one or two big purchases and then secure one or two smaller developers that are already like in their orbit and then probably leave it. Because they they make these really clever second and obviously fluid third party deals. For instance, the third party deal for Final Fantasy VII Remake was obviously reworked at some point. So they're going back to these different deals. But I said on the show that uh, on Sacred Symbols, I made the argument that Sony might want to make a really reinforce themselves with a consortium of Japanese publishers. Um, Square Enix obviously makes a ton of sense for them. I think it's probably the most obvious acquisition for them. And I wouldn't be surprised if Square was shedding a lot of its Western weight, knowing that per potential buyer like Sony would probably not want something like Tomb Raider since they have Uncharted, for instance, and they just wouldn't need these things. So make yourself lighter and more viable. And then you see some. So I was saying Capcom, Tecmo Koei, Bandai Namco and Square Enix. You can see two of the four being purchased by Sony, I think, in this situation. And then you would maybe see them make like some some strike for a big Western developer, an IO style or CD project style operation, Techland, something like that. Now, these all have different owners at different times. Some of them are on their public markets in their own country. So you don't have to come in with a lot of money to convince the shareholders. I mean, this is just what happened with Activision. They had a vote on it. So nothing is set in stone. But I think that that's probably the way they go forward. They will, in my mind, be suicidal not to react in some way um, because they have, an, they have a competitor that's, uh, they said in their own words, able to spend them out of business. And I would take them, I would take that very literally. Um, and really, the, the advantage that Sony has is that they are a, Though they are a very cagey and weird partner on on the outside, they they don't talk very much. They've removed all of their personality. It's just totally scrubbed for the last five or six years. Behind the scenes, they are really cold calculators when it comes to making money. And partners like working with them because they their games sell. When people look at Final Fantasy 16, which is probably more like four million copies sold, they're like, "That's soft." I'm like, "I don't think so, dude." Um, I think a lot. Of, I think everyone made quite a bit of money on that deal, actually, and I think everyone's really happy about that. Square Enix probably didn't have to pay for marketing. They probably have a different split that's more advantageous than a 70-30 split, or they got money during development. So they've made their money back several times over. So they're happy as pig and shit. Sony probably sold, you know, 500,000 PS5s just so people can play this game that we're waiting for the game to come out and all the rest. So I think if they can make those small incremental steps and just kind of seal themselves off, they'll be good because they have a major advantage in, in frankly, in reputation and in numbers in terms of people that are playing on their console. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so that's that's in my opinion. I don't want to go on too long. I know you guys have to go, but that that's my uh, that would be my reinforcing principle for them. What I think they'll do. So I wouldn't be surprised if they acquired two of those four Japanese companies and then some big Western so you're, entity. So you're saying they 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 have to make a move in terms of acquisition in terms of counting because looking like this obviously is going to close within the next you know few days. Um, but best course of action is an acquisition. Well, I think that if if it was up to me and it didn't and I, I'm I. Like, I'm not Jim Ryan, where you have like the economic smarts of like, I know what I'm doing. I have an MBA and all that kind of shit. Um, but if I were just making creative decisions, like I said, I would make smaller acquisitions and just really keep it tight on a quality level and just really sell the quality. But I think based on what I know about all of this, and I don't know anything about acquisition. No one knows the acquisitions before they, leave, they happen. I'm not saying that. But based on what we know about what's going on in the consolidation in the industry, I think what's clear is that Sony has to look at Microsoft as a company that is willing to foreclose on major things, and they simply must have things under their belt to counter them. Yeah. In other words, it's kind of like mutually assured destruction. When if if, and it's not quite quite that way because the leverage that Microsoft would have with Call of Duty would be so much bigger. But if Sony acquired, say, Square Enix, and they got like some rights of like EA games, or whatever, and they were like, well, we have, and they both had their guns out towards each other, and they're like, well, you can still have all these. But we want to make sure we always have that. And then they can play nice with each other. I think that that's probably what Sony's going to have to do is, is have that that powder because they don't have that powder right now because their games are all bespoke exclusives. So they never were on Xbox anyway. They need to go and now put that into danger, I think. And that sucks, by the way. I hate that. But that that yeah. I think is I think that that's the way it's going to go. I, I think that that is truly 
shitty, but I think mm-hmm. it would be very surprising. If yeah. I, I said on the show, like there's probably, and I mean this, a break glass in case of emergency thing at Sony headquarters. I'm not literally, but figuratively where they're like, this deal is going through here. are The five companies I want you guys to go, you know, your the teams to go research and to investigate. Are you available? What's your cash flow? Do you want to open your books to us? Are you interested in an acquisition? All of that. I bet you that that's happening as we speak. Yeah. So, I thought the only yeah. publishers that would give them that type of leverage where they like where Microsoft and other parties would have to say like, yeah, we need still need access to that. That's take two with GTA. That mm-hmm. um, you know, EA they have some uh, one of the licensed games they they would have to like agree since they they pretty much are monopoly on sports sims. Um, yeah, that's I I can see that I can see that happening, it, it, and it, that does suck that we will probably go through one of these again. Um, a product from a side place because they would it would have to be with those type of moves where where Sony feels like hey we have to take action where now they have to like come to the table with us because we're going to close this uh, deal. And and I, the first thing I look at is like, all right, who's an equivalent to Activision where you can start point, point to a game as a necessity to a platform and hey, look at take two. Yeah. yeah take two I, is definitely the target, but I, I think that just money's too expensive right now, mm-hmm. you know, because like, I think Sony could make an argument and people that know more about M and a would be able to speak to this, but they could approach their shareholders and be like, we're taking out a major loan to make this acquisition. And like, this is how it's going to pay back. And this is why we're doing it to protect ourselves. And I think that those things do happen. And like, uh, or like we're, you know, licensing X, Y, and Z. Sony owns all sorts of shit. And they're also selling off a bunch of stuff to make themselves more liquid. They're getting, they're spinning themselves off in their financial investments and all that. I think so like their financial services investments. I don't want to say their financial investments. So I think that like anything in a cheaper market would have been possible. But I just think that that's so out of reach for them based on their lack of cash on hand, you know, mm-hmm. um, but I think that take two would be the obvious like p- counter punch. And I think it really is a shame, but I think that it is like it, we are getting we're going to get to a point of mutually assured destruction because I think this is kind of a crude analogy. People, but this is very sacred symbols analogy is like you think about the two atomic bombs on Japan, right? And like the first one was Bethesda and everyone's like, wow, you're really going to do this. And And then the second one is like you know, Activision is like, all right, so you really are going to do this. We really do need to change the kind of game. We didn't quite expect that you had mo- another counter punch behind that first punch. And I think Sony looks at Bethesda and I think is very wary that what happened with Bethesda and clearly, clearly, regardless of how you feel about Microsoft, a lot of back talk and counter talk about the way they were going to treat Bethesda and that they knew that games were going to be exclusive and they didn't really want to say that and all that. It's all in those emails. Right. And I think I think Sony looks at that and says, like, you are going to do the same thing. You know, I think the only thing that matters to them, though, is that. And I think that Sony realizes, which is why they didn't give a shit about the 10 year agreement, because they shouldn't, because they're like, you need us. Call of Duty, Call of Duty's profit runs through PlayStation. Right. Right now. It might not in a few years, but right now it does. And you're going to need that money. So I find that I find that really interesting. It's it's a it's a. It's two dudes with nuclear bombs pointed at each other. It's two dudes with two guns pointed at each other. It's just uh, it's unfortunate because I think that it didn't necessarily have to be this way. And people that say things like, oh, but Tencent would have come in and bought them. It's like, I really don't think that the government would allow Tencent to have bought Activision. I don't think so. I just don't think that that would have happened. Like yeah, like it, Huawei, Huawei is not the, 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 mobile, the massive Chinese mobile company, Huawei. I don't know if you guys remember when they tried to come to the United States. They were like, no, I don't think so. Like, they're not even allowed to operate here at all. So I just think that the regulatory the regulatory differences between like a big foreign entity like that coming in and gobbling up a company would have been different. I think Microsoft is uniquely positioned. It wouldn't have been, they wouldn't have been treated the same if they were a different company either, you know? So, um, I yeah, know, the FTC, fine. uh, the FTC court hearing would have went completely different. <laughs> that was Tencent on the other end. Dude, Congress would have, I mean, look at what Congress and rightfully so Congress is flipping its lid about the live golf PGA merger. Right. And they should, because that's bullshit. But like, Congress is involved in that, and that's way less money, like way, way, way less money than what's going on here. Mm. Um, so I just don't. So I think you have to look at things through that lens, too. Maybe some other Western entity would have done and maybe I don't know. Um, but so I don't think it was necessarily inevitable. I think that this just had to happen. I think it makes sense for the shareholders. I'm sure Bobby Kotick is fucking amped as he's taking his four hundred million dollar <laughs> golden parachute out. Um, you know, all the, all go the buy players him. that have been on Twitter, like the Lulu Chang or whatever. Yeah. Um, um, she. Uh, she is amped. I'm sure I, I can't imagine how much money she's making off of this. You know, yeah, other people that go are by their own little islands right. next to each other. That's <laughs> why. I, I, so I'd, I'd be amped, too. And I have no problem with that. But I just think, yeah, I care about 
I care about video games and I think it's maybe someone who owns a studio that's just up and up and coming and trying to survive. I totally get the grind of Game Pass and taking the games for gold money or whatever, but I also defer to the to the knowledge of the AAA is that people really care about. They don't really care about my games. They really care about Uncharted. You know, yeah. they really care about Halo. Like they they really care about Final Fantasy 16 or whatever. So, I don't know. I'm very protective of that. And I always think it's worth like debating it and I always think it's worth coming on like you guys have allowed me to kind of sharpen my my uh, arguments a little bit because there's not a lot of a disagreement about this topic on sacred symbols and uh, I'm going to have to go and talk to the Dukes in the coming days. So I'll, I'll be a little bit better. Prepared <laughs> <now>. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I appreciate you coming on, Carl. We're going to go ahead and uh, uh, s- settle this up. I think smooth. Yeah. Uh, it, it, Mom, see, it, the thing about you calling is like, you might disagree with stuff, but there's people that do stuff and you could tell that they're just doing it for their own growth that, you know, they, they might come out there, make some kind of statement on Twitter, you know, that they don't necessarily care about anything but themselves. But when you make statements, even if I disagree, I'm like, I know that the intentions of everything you say is for the good of the gaming industry. Sure. The definition of where the industry should go between me and you might be different, but I know you want it around in the, in the future. Like you could sense that passion. And that, that's what I always re- like, even when people are like, oh, calling this, calling that. I'm like, look, you can disagree with the man, but he has put in his time to give his opinion. And, and I, to this day, I still don't agree with, you know, I I understand you have a political view, smooth too. He gets a lot of hash for his political views. And, and it's like, at the end of the day, it's like, this is the gaming industry and we shouldn't be, you know, judgery and executioner over stuff that has nothing to do with the stuff we're actually talking about. Right. I agree. And I also wanted to say that, like, that's why I thought it was so ironic about like the position of the, and, and again, it, it, it's, it goes, it's not to say that these people are trying to be political. It just goes to show you to your point that it, it's meaningless, how incredibly right wing the pro Activision merger is, you know, like <laughs> it's a, it's a completely anti-government, anti FTC, yeah. anti even like, yeah anti anti monopoly position but no one gives a shit because it fits those different paradigms that would in other circumstances have them maligned for that same viewpoint that's why i think i don't take i get a lot of gruff and i know that but i don't really take it very personally because um first of all it says something and i'm not trying to be a dickhead to my detractors but it says a lot about our content and the power but that like they're very fixated on it right so like i take that seriously and i i mean that i think it's awesome great fixate on my content and 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 share it around and be upset about it and thumb it down if you want and whatever, but I'm going to continue to say what I want. Just, and we've, we've created a, a huge audience. Like we have more than 13,000 paying subscribers. Like I don't like, we are a very successful show. I don't need like, you know, I don't want to base like my self-worth on like social media detractors when it, I know that, that I have a, a huge audience of people that love the content. That's what I always that. try to tell smooth, man. Like you gotta be more picky on what you put out on social media. Cause even though if you feel that way, it's like, logically does it make sense arguing with people about that <laughs> i was to say i've been this i mean i was never really very crazy on social media to be honest but oh no he's I, insane on no, social I, media and i appreciate I, that's like totally fine whatever anyone does on social media is I, I i don't really even know what like who the individuals who are saying what about me i just know that these things are circulating but i i think that like that's fine but i don't i just don't want i don't want my like i don't want to be known for that kind of content yeah, I hear you know you. like I, and i don't um like I've I've swung at people and fought back like a couple of years ago. I just stopped posting. I just post my content on Twitter now and I don't just don't even, and then I just mute it and just people can say whatever they want. But I just want to make sure the content is getting out there. But uh, I think it's like important not to read too much into that because the even when people were mad a couple of weeks ago, like we had a very, quote unquote, unpopular episode of Sacred Symbols where people were really upset about it. And I went and looked at it on YouTube and it had like a five or six to one positive like a like to dislike ratio. I'm like, what is this? Like. I'm not going to focus on this small group of like what 200 people that are rage watching my content when we have 70 or 80,000 people listening to every episode of the show. It's like, um, so I, I, I do care about games. I care about other creators too. I don't want to have like, I don't want to have a, um, an adversarial relationship with people at all. So that's why I just choose to either just, I just kind of ignore all the feedback that comes to me, but I make it clear and I made it clear on a re- recent episode of sacred that like, I'm happy to come on for any, any, anyone's podcast for a long term or a long form conversation about my positions. Cause I can defend all of them. I don't just say things and like, and, and imagine that I would never have to defend them. It seems kind of silly. <laughs> I actually told smooth. I was like, 
Make sure you cross your T's and dot your I's. This is Colin. We're going into this podcast. <laughs> yeah, no, I was, yeah, yeah. It's, it's sad that I became like there's that that salty gamer guy. Yeah, and I I feel bad about that because I didn't mean for like that to be like a career defining moment for him. You know, um, that wasn't my intention at all. I'm not trying to like insult anyone. He was just no. Really, I, I he was, was just really unprepared for that. I, I mean. yeah, I was talking mainly about. Make sure you. Yeah, no, no, I didn't. Uh, and sources though. I, yeah, I didn't have anything. I just wanted to. I mean, get like a you know a fresh take off the Activision. I did. We, we addressed the question um, that I want, but I don't have like a. I've never gotten so mad at uh, a take from Colin where I felt I needed to debate it. So, uh, with the exception of um, like I get upset at people who use. Collins vids and weaponize yeah, it and then content, and it yeah. drives it's like yo you hold on to everything this man says and, and this that, the, it seems like only the opposite happens I never see there there's like, a core group of like you know guys that are you know you know are like you know PlayStation guys who when when you drop a video and it's made when it's talking about Xbox they use that as this is this is it boom like told you bots like this and it's and it's a column yeah, the, there's a there's a good amount of playstation fanboys calling that weaponize your weapons and try to make them as bazookas and shoot xbox fanboys yeah i don't them. like that either that's actually why i went on that guy's podcast to begin with i think was because he was upset that i was like disrespecting one of my own people that was like weaponizing my content and that's why i was saying before like i don't i only share my clips of myself talking because i'm afraid of happening to forcing on someone else what's happened to me in the past but I think that like I know a lot of it is like performance which is fine um I don't take it seriously and and I I think that uh it's good to like get out of your ecosystems and and your echo chambers and talk to other people because yeah um it simply allows you to like check your own preconceptions and test your own theories as well which I that's why I was saying I meant it I was like it's very nice to be able to kind of like bounce things off of you guys and see how you feel because uh you know maddie and cog are certainly gonna be ready to swing i think on tuesday when we record and i think that's gonna be a lot of fun um i'm really looking forward to it actually and making my arguments for the audience and, and at the same time some of the audience was so frustrated because we recorded our shows or sacred symbols is very long but we recorded a almost five hour episode our last episode but we didn't bring up the ftc or xbox stuff at all and people were so mad about it like we just didn't even talk about it um, it's like it's like that's the point that's the reason you have defining do <laughs> yeah well exactly and i also just feel like I, I again try to monitor what we become known about people are tuning in for like anti-xbox stuff which is yeah. never the intention and i don't want people to like get yeah. that out of the show it's not what it's about yeah, yeah. So. that's exactly yeah pretty much that's pretty much what happens in the case is that uh people like you utilize your content uh as a weapon to be anti um xbox and they direct it directly at us and so next thing we know we're pretty much arguing over stuff with your content <laughs> as the main yeah, source the Make your own content and, and share your own goddamn content i think I, I it's fine if people want to do that i guess i i just the thing that disappoints me the most is just being clipped out of context like yep. uh i saw a clip going around saying that I said exclusives don't matter yeah. and I'm like damn is that out of context man that is so out of context I can't even believe how out of context people would so I know people have the audacity to really smear and share things that are just not true and set a, a different kind of like a different expectation of what you said in that yeah, I'm pretty, in that what, case what, I was, was that was that on that was on I don't work podcast yeah oh oh that was oh, okay yeah that's what that's what I was talking about like compare like when you're watching a show and you're excited about a game why do you care if it's exclusive or not if you're excited about it that yeah. was like my whole argument how is that a bad argument but people cut out just that one part where it's like i don't care about exclusives and like I don't, or whatever it says and i'm like i didn't really say that so i know that people weaponize it in both directions and i wish people would just make their own content about games instead of you know they can focus well, on on the content about uh, the content about the content about games is just what they're doing i guess you know, most know? people they, they want to make critiques on mm. what it's like to to you know yeah. start a company like last stand or run a podcast mm. like iop and none of them do any of that I shit. but we we, we, we got to close out yeah here. we're gonna close out. i think the, the overall matter of it is that people cling to especially places because some people not everybody has the voice or the uh mental fortitude to speak of things in such a way where they can get their message across and it sounds smart so you're that person that says what they want to say in a smart way so that it can't be i guess argued um to a degree and anytime someone with sense uh, is able to speak against you know xbox and do it so 
smartly, <laughs> for lack of better terms, it's like, yes, here it is. Here it is. Got him. Um, but um, again, it's all fun, uh, fun and games. And, and Colin, I uh, thank you uh, for committing to the show, showing up in such short notice. <laughs> no, it's all, it's all good. I'm, I'm happy to do it. Like I said, like I don't. Uh, Micah, my fiance, is our coordinator. She does our merch and she does our ca calendars and stuff like that. So she does all the scheduling. And she was like, well, we can do it this weekend. Like I said, because I, I dropped the ball on on doing um, like a getaway this weekend. So I was like, yeah, let's just get it right out of the way. I mean, I think this is an exciting time to talk about about uh, about Xbox and and maybe less about PlayStation. I mean, there's not really a whole lot going on. It's kind of boring, actually, but we're doing the best yes. we can. When I was uh, emailing Micah, I was just like, look, I promise it's a plan. It's called Planet Xbox, but I promise it's going to be respectful. There's not going to be no crazy shit. Oh, dude, I, I like I I the beef in like over like this or whatever is so much more palatable to me. Like, I want the beef like this, you know, like if people want to yeah. talk and like actually say it and like argue, not literally fight, but argue their points. I think that's awesome, you know. So like, I'm happy to go into like Planet Xbox. Yeah, I'm going. I'll go into like so-called enemy territory. I don't mind at all. Like, it, it's uh, again, it allows me to sharpen my arguments outside of our own ecosystem, so I don't get too, um, you know, polar in terms of like w my points of view. Which I'm so I'm thankful to, to be on, and, and I'm happy to do anyone's podcast. So yeah, thank you for thank you for the invite. All right, all right, Attic. You got anything to say before we uh, close the podcast out? Uh, people, that's at this point. If you ain't watch ILP this week, King gonna just be. I'm. I'm not even gonna say no. I'm gonna mute my mic. I'm gonna just let him go. Uh, it's it's crazy how crazy he gonna be tomorrow. I don't even know what he gonna say. Mm. I tried to get it out of him. He wouldn't tell me. So like, I'll tune in with my whole line shirt. Was, I, when I was on the show last time, he wasn't there. He was on. He was out doing something or whatever. And I was disappointed that we missed each other. I, I think he's funny. Yeah, he's. It's definitely a good addition to ILP. Well, again, thank you to everyone. Uh, I know we didn't get to some of the Patreon questions. Promise we'll ask those uh, um, uh, next show. Uh, but Colin, again, thank you. Attic, thank you guys. Uh, Weapon Will Podcast, uh, thank you. Uh, it's been a great episode. Uh, make sure you guys check it out. Continue to support us. And we will see you guys next week. As always, Xbox is the best box, and I am the best bot. Good night or good morning if you're on the other side of the globe. We are out of here. Peace.